Warning, the following podcast contains spoilers for all published books in George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire. G'day and welcome to Krakencast. This is the Oceanic branch of the Vassals of Kingsgrave Game of Thrones review series. Today we'll be discussing episode 10 of season 4, entitled The Children. My name is Duncan, or Valkyrus on the forums, and joining me today from Australia is Jessica. Hi guys, Jessica309 from the forums. From China, we have Bing. Hello, I'm Xu China in the forums. From New Zealand, we have Joseph. G'day, I go by Chow Gamer on the forums. And he's a little bit under the weather, but he's powering on, like a soldier. And uh, from New Zealand, we have Tanya. Hi, I'm Silence on the forums. And also, we have one more Australian uh, for their first podcast appearance, Michael. Hey guys, I am Carl Wadegi on the forums. And where are you calling from, Michael? I'm from the Sunshine Coast, which is just above Brisbane. Is there any sunshine there? Uh, not at the moment. It's pretty grey. It's like... <sighs> Yeah, we were just commenting about how rainy and drizzly it is in Australia. It's it's horrible. It's supposed to be sunny here. Yeah, and all the um all the other podcasts are talking about that. Be- you know, it's so hot outside, and I hate them all. Spare me. <laughs> yeah. Dragon cast. <laughs> Let them have their pleasant anyway. temperature. <laughs> hard conditions breed hard men. <laughs> <laughs> That sounded so cool with your voice, like all. Yeah. <laughs> sounded like an Ironborn then. We need to get a whole bunch of um of Ironborn quotes and just get you to read them all, and then that can oh, be yeah. sort of our mantra. That would be good. Do the, do the do what is dead may never die. What is dead may never die, but rises again harder and stronger. Nice, Sarah. Right, let's yeah. go on to the beginning. Yay! Kiwi <laughs> accent. So um, this is the uh, final episode. I can't believe it's gone this fast. Yeah. The wait begins. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. It feels like we just started. It's only 10 episodes. Yeah. So um, what did you guys think of this episode? Uh, Jessica, do you want to start with Lemon Cake Ratings? Uh, all right. I had a little bit of trouble with this one because I watch a little bit later than everyone else, but I do read all the reviews, and I was really expecting it to be an absolute crap fest. And while I acknowledge there are a lot of problems, um, I still enjoy the episode, but what wasn't in the episode was the problem. Um, so I gave it a three. Which is probably pretty good for me. Hmm, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, what about you, Bing? Um, so uh, I try to ignore what's what's not in the episode. <laughs> Hopefully, it's well, except for one part. Uh, I really think the Taisha part. They they sort of have to keep that part in, just for if they really don't didn't, don't put that part in, they should have replaced it with something. As it is, the um, King's Landing scenes all seem very rushed, and that was supposed to be the meat of this episode. So I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I feel I still like the Tyrion confrontation with um, with Tywin, and that's the most important part. So I'm I'm giving it a four, and um, four out of five lemon cakes. I, I all the brand stuff was uh, not impressive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was very uh, very '90s RPG esque. Not, are... not in a good way. You're wrong. That was awesome. Uh, what about you, Joseph? <laughs> all right. So bad, it's good. <laughs> Uh, judging the episode on its own merits, I really enjoyed it, and just as is, if I put the books aside, it's probably my favourite episode this season. However, I am not at all forgiving of for uh, missed opportunities and stuff like Lady Stoneheart, stuff like Taisha, uh, all that, I'm going to give it one lemon cake, which is admittedly a very nice lemon cake, but it, I can't give it any more due to all the missed opportunities. Ooh, do you feel like Whoa. you're being a bit harsh, though, for... I mean, I know there was a lot of expectations of this episode, but I feel like everyone was pinning the whole season on this one episode to save the season in terms of all the problems it created. And because it didn't deliver, there's been a a backlash. Do you feel like that might be how you're feeling? Kind of. I'm not really much one for uh, hype. I don't get excited for things that are happening in the future. But uh, I guess I was a bit excited for this, although I feel just in general, they really didn't like uh, David and Dan were trumpeting. This is their amazing episode and they just it was good, but it could have been so much better. So book readers perspective, they didn't deliver. So stingy lemon cakes from me. Uh, what about you, Tanya? Um, I yeah, I, I feel I feel the same way about it, I guess, even though I wouldn't be as harsh with lemon cakes. I don't know. But um, there, there were some really good moments in there, but but it was really rushed and they could have done 
pretty much everything that was in this episode much better if they had taken a bit more time for it, maybe left some things out and, and yeah, like they wasted time on some scenes that they really could have used for other uh, scenes. So maybe two point two 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 just two without point two point two two recurring. <laughs> <laughs> yes, infinite. <Exactly. laughs> Uh, what about you, Michael? Um, I think I'll give this a four. Uh, I think I, I did enjoy it, um, but there were a lot of little things that started bringing it down. So, yeah, four. Well, I feel like I'm in the minority. I really like this episode. Um, I'm almost tempted to give it like a five just for like nostalgic reasons, just for some of the scenes. Um, I don't know. It just had some really amazing moments, especially the stuff with Arya and... Uh, it felt, uh, I love the sense of finality and there's a lot of main characters ending on these really sort of poignant notes of closure and departure. And uh, yeah, I liked all the scenes of characters walking away from people they love, like John and Grit and Danny and the dragons and Mira and Jojen and Tyrion and Jamie. And so that, that I thought that theme worked quite well. Um, but yeah, as you said, the stuff in King's Landing and the stuff at the wall was pretty good but it just could have been so much better um you just you just look at what's on screen and say why didn't you do this why didn't you do this uh, it's so good but it, there's so, exactly there's so much potential and it's all being wasted um but yeah i'd still give it a four point i don't know two five so I, I still quite liked it um not my favorite but middle of the road i guess for for the for the season um but i guess let's get into it with the wall uh is a scene that probably could have just been at the end of last episode but <laughs> alas oh yeah um, so john walks through the literal feast of crows of last night's battle uh and makes his way to the wildling camps in the woods he enters mance raider's tent to negotiate mance reveals the reason for his attack to put the wall between his people and the white walkers john contemplates killing mance but the parlay is interrupted by the arrival of stannis baratheon who smashes the wildling camp with his cavalry and uh, upon meeting john he takes mance prisoner it should have been last episode it really should have yeah, just adding yeah. Stannis into that equation, it becomes so much more than just Jon Snow. Like, yeah. I think that thematically, um, they wanted last episode to just be the battle. And they do want it to just be on Jon Snow, unfortunately. I mean, or two people who like Jon Snow, unfortunately, I guess. Um, but um, considering considering the, the, the time troubles that they run into, yeah, it might have been better. If, well, at least just like part of the scene was put into, um, put into la- last week's episode. Like, like we can just stop right at the time which man since the pe- something's going wrong yeah I think, something like that i think yeah you and jessica made the point that they were trying to cast john snow in the role of this ultimate hero and having right. stannis arrive would have negated that but uh, like as i, I can think it was you joseph that pointed out that having stannis arrive is such an awesome climax it's a natural ending mm-hmm. to that battle and had to have it all contained within one hour of, of storytelling would have been so perfect um and you could easily just take this uh, this scene and plonk it at the end of last episode. It would have brought in the motivations of the wildlings, showing their side of it, the moral ambiguity there, and and the threat of the wildlings sort of casting a shadow over both groups of people. And then Stannis bringing in the importance of the whole War of the Five Kings into this otherwise very peripheral uh, part of the storyline. It, it would have been perfect. I'm almost tempted to just like re edit it. Now, Do like, it. Like up on YouTube. <laughs> like, if you look at like what I said last week, I pointed out all the sort of video game cinematography, and uh, if you look at the how this first scene was filmed, like you get another one of those like overhead Call of Duty Predator drone shots as the cavalry's <laughs> meeting. Well, yeah, you get all the dynamic shots, all like the the uh, looking up shots at people fighting, and since the the like the directing matches the last episode so strongly. I genuinely think that this was all filmed as one lump and they just chopped the end off in order to add it to their massive, amazing, super cool final. Mm. Like, I, That's I genuinely think true. It's they wanted... all together and they broke it. Yeah. They wanted to be able to get it nominated for, what was it, Emmys or Golden Globes or whatever they nominated it for. And they wanted to do that and they're like, oh man, this episode is really weak. I know, we'll take the strongest part from last episode and put it in this episode and... We've got how many awards are we going to win? But it doesn't work like that, idiots. Some people have said that might be the case because uh, who is Neil Marshall said that he filmed uh, three specific battles and and that might have been the third battle because it does it does feel so cinematic. It feels so in line with the epic scale and the you know, special effects that were obviously in episode nine and it, yeah yeah I, I agree that the, the bird's eye view of, of the um formations of the troops did feel very uh, age of empires or something and uh, <laughs> i loved i loved the shot just 
above the forest where you have the two uh, while the, uh, the two um, cavalry charges like going into each other and they're these yeah. Yeah, converging and they're like perfectly straight lines and in between them you just see the scattered wildlings it's like a great juxtaposition between the two uh, Discipline forces on disciplines, yeah. yeah the precision of Stannis against the, the, the wildling rabble of men's and you also see in this episode as well like the the character appearances like Mance appearing he should have appeared during the battle that of the army that he was leading. So to he, for him to not appear until the next episode is very strange. And then even with the scenes that we did have with the war for the rest of the episode, we had them burning the dead. We had um, John burning Ugrit. We had John talking to Tormund. Like we had those those closure scenes that we, we're used to for after a big battle like that. We had the aftermath. And it just seems like it was never supposed to be that because they could have left that on that note at the end of the season they could have they could have left it at stannis stannis rides in saves the day you know and that's it for the night's watch definitely but they had all those those draggy on bits with that burning the bodies and stuff that you wouldn't have if the battle was always intended to finish this episode right yeah that's one thing that bothered me actually i felt like if they'd spent less time at the wall and didn't have that whole burning igrid's body and, and all that kind of unnecessary stuff they would have had time to do some other scenes much better. Because I do feel like they just ran out of time and, and they could have not wasted as much time at the wall. Yeah, King's Landing especially, that felt really rushed. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that egret yeah. burning, that was just so long. Not particularly long, but yeah, it could have been shorter. could have been more concise. But they had the moment last episode when she died. I felt like that was enough. On top of that, yeah. it, it didn't... It, that, one thing that bothered me is that Tormund tells them there's no point in saying any words over the dead because they can't hear them, but the dead do care where they get burned. How does that make any sense? <laughs> well, I think they Screw just the want to burn Screw the yeah. other wildlings, just the grit. That's true. And I, mean, I also very... love that Ygritte had a shoulder exposed. Like, even in death, she's <laughs> given, like, a little sexy pose on her on a funeral <laughs> pyre. I was a bit like, ooh, that that's not cute. nice. That's not nice. Yeah, I noticed yeah. that. I was thinking, like, what did John, like, did John purposefully expose <laughs> that shoulder? Like, like, is there something really bad going on behind the, behind it, the it camera? Rem- it reminds him of, of the cave. It's like, mm, that shoulder. I also I also wonder where he found her, because he must have gone through, like, all the wilding corpses back in Castle Black. Yeah, just that, that sort of implied scene of they all stack the corpses and John has to go sifting through them for half an hour. Yeah, and look for his yeah I would have liked to see that scene if they were going to waste that much time at the hall. Or the two hours he spends Weird. chopping and building up that massive pile of wood. So actually, um, I've been trolling for, so this is just sort of, I guess, a season overview since I've been hearing a lot of people, I guess, book readers finding this season kind of disappointing. Um, a lot of, a lot of, I think non-book readers actually find this season to be the best season of them all. So I yeah. guess something, something before this episode must have must have been working even with all those fillers. Um, and but like this episode does seem incredibly rushed. So I mean, I don't know. I do feel like, at the very least, they should have just cut out some of the, the scenes in this very episode. Like uh, Egret yeah. burning, I agree, is just not necessary at all. And and even and even the the, the, the burning of the the, the the night's watchman that could have been shorter. Although I like Melisandre staring at John creepily. I fucking John saying, "Let's make a baby next season." <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> it did establish uh, that uh, you know uh, Lady Selyse and Shireen and Davos are all at Castle Black as well, which is kind of I don't know. That's kind of exciting to me. There's a pretty good ensemble cast at the Wall at this point. Right. You've got Stannis, John, Davos, Melisandre, Tormund, Mance, all in one place. That's yeah, it's but they could have established though. that. They could have established that early next season, though. I think that would have been. Yeah. I think we still needed that scene though, with them burning the dead of the Night's Watch with everyone in in that area w- watching them burn. I think that was a really effective episode to set up. You know, this the mm-hmm. the fights happened. You know, these are all the players at the wall for next season. I wouldn't have minded a um a glimpse of maybe um Thorn. Sitting there in a wheelchair, looking a bit sore, but still there. Uh, that that mm. and Sam, did we see Sam? And we did, yeah. and Slint is still yeah. walking around and not in a cage yes. where he should be. <laughs> yeah, but I did like that we saw all the major players. And they've really set up the wall for next season. And I, I'm I'm looking forward to that storyline the most, actually. Yeah, me too. It's a lot of potential yeah. there, and I guess the election storyline might frame a lot of next season and 
the Ramsey tensions with Ramsey and the Boltons. Yeah, I and mean, I'm glad they put that off till next season too. I mean, that would have been if they're going to keep the battle as late as they were, then I think putting the election of the new Lord Commander to next season is definitely a good idea. Yeah, certainly gives John yeah. a lot of stuff to do. Not a mm-hmm. dull moment like in this season. <laughs> <laughs> the election needs to feel monumental. It needs to feel like they're actually accomplishing something. So yeah, if they tried to just squish it into this episode, it, like. I guess if you crunch the numbers, there's also also there's only something like 40 Nights Watchmen left, so there aren't that <laughs> there's relatively high percentage chance of John getting picked. But yeah, like yeah. they need to like spread it over a few episodes. Show like at first he doesn't have a chance, and then some people are won over, and then a couple episodes later everyone adores him. Like it needs to feel like an achievement, and they'll need time for that definitely. Well, they've they've super simplified. Even though they had a lot of room this season to explore the wall, they've really simplified it. There's no sense of all the other castles along the wall and the commanders and and the fact that John is taking control of the defense of the castle. It's basically takes place over one night after uh, mm-hmm. Alice of Thorn goes down. He takes charge for the last couple of hours of the battle. But in in the books, it's over a couple of weeks that he's doing all these things. And people, mm-hmm. the men in the castle, are so impressed by him. Um, and the commanders. You know, at, at Shadow, at Shadow Tower, and East Watch are impressed by that. That's kind of where he gets a lot of his support from the men on the ground. Yeah, and I think next season they need to establish that. May it, it'd be as simple as having a bunch of men ride into the wall and be like, "Look, we're reinforcements sent by the Shadow Tower and East Watch, and now you've got enough men to do a legitimate election." But, you know, that, that's as simple as it needs to be because that's how it happened in the books anyway. They got a huge injection of men from East Watch, so. You know, it's not like they can't solve the problem with only having 50 men, which is what is that what they said in this episode? That there were 50 men, so they lost half their men in the battle? I think it was on the forums, either that or on the Facebook group. I saw someone did a rough count and it came out to about uh, 40 on screen deaths, something like that. But, you know, God knows how many there were off screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you count the screams and assume each one is someone dying. <laughs> <laughs> we just take a moment to appreciate the uh, that one wildling red shirt that just charged Stannis and Davos and just got mown <laughs> down? <laughs> well, Stannis just didn't even flinch. Yeah, casual yeah. love. Yeah, that was funny. It was lucky Stannis wasn't riding faster, though, otherwise that other guy would have crashed into him. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it was all a bit showy. It's probably not how things would have been done. Stannis would have probably been in the way of the back. If, if it was real life, Stannis would have been like, holy crap, I would have been there in like a minute. Mance <laughs> that could have been, been me. <laughs> yeah, Mance would have been in chains by the time Stannis got to the front of the lines. But this is show Stannis where he's like first on the beach and all that. <laughs> Commando yeah, no Stannis, exactly. Stannis. <laughs> Commando, with no helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know whether they invented helmets in Westeros yet, because no one ever wears a helmet. They did. They yeah, did. No, no, but... It's- if you've got a lord... Your social status is directly proportional to the amount of your exposed scalp. Of course, yeah. <laughs> clearly. And of course, and of course, people with helmets won't aim for your head because you're a named character and you get paid too much to be on the show to be taken out by a stupid head blow. And you spent all this time on your hair. You're not going to mess it up with a helmet. <laughs> Do you know how long they yeah. spent makeup? <laughs> Actually, I'm surprised that the hand didn't wear his helmet more just to save time on painting on his burns every day. It was such That's a cool true. helmet as well. It was, yeah. And now they can't have that thing where. Um, someone picks up the helmet and goes terrorizing people. And I guess it's only right, a small part of the book, but it's, it's a cool little yeah. detail. Well, the that was, that was that Roger. Just don't exist anymore, so right. it's okay. And that was Roger and Biden, they're dead already anyways. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everyone's dead. They kill more well, people than George exists. would even dare. Yeah. <laughs> I am I'm sort of... I really liked Mance Raider in this episode, but it kind of reminded me how short shrift the wildlings have gotten like they're a really fleshed out kind of civilization or maybe not civilization but like the culture of the wildlings and all the different wildling characters are really interesting in the books there's so many of them whereas here it's just Mance. he's basically the figurehead for a hundred thousand anonymous strangers but um but I, I, I really... as figurehead he should have done something a bit smarter and gone to the wall with a negotiating party and had a chat to the lord commander and be like hey you know there's bloody whites and cold and white walkers out here, can we um come through, please? Rather than launching an assault on the wall and trying to take what they want by force, why not just talk, negotiate? I hate that trope in TV where people don't communicate properly and that's what the plot's based on. But the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch isn't going to let 100,000 wildlings through the wall. 
Yeah, so, but, oh, please, settle your 100,000 uh, raiders, rapists, and pillagers on my <laughs> on my settled uh, land full of, of southerners. Yeah, force but was the only option it. available, really. But they didn't, but I just feel like they didn't try it. I mean, if you think, what if the wildlings had come to um, Geo Mormont after he'd been attacked, but they'd had the white attack at Castle Black? Do you think that they would be a bit more open to it then? Or at Show least Walmart. a discussion or working or talking it through. I mean, I feel like open warfare is a last resort, and I'm not sure if I agree with the wildlings taking violence as the first. I don't think they would be open to it. I think um, you see all the old commanders that John has to deal with. He's the only person pushing for the to settle the wildlings um, south of the wall. Even when he takes hostages, he imprisons all their commanders. They're still they still think of the wildlings as these monsters. Um, they don't think of them as people. It, it took John to actually live among them to see them as human beings, and that's how he's able to uh, argue for them to be let through the wall. You also look at Show Mormont. It's, first of all, he tolerates Craster sacrificing his uh, newborn sons to the White Walkers, or at the very least to the uh, quasi-mythical North spirits that Craster seems to believe in from the Night's Watch's perspective. And also the fact that, yeah, like as you said, a lot of the upper leadership is just very stuck in its ways. And I think even Jaw would probably have quite a dehumanized view of the wildlings after spending decades and decades like pursuing them and, and, and fighting against them. Yeah, it's kind of this war of attrition that they don't even know why they hate each other anymore, but they just do. And all they know is fighting. They don't, they don't communicate in any sense other than through bloodshed. So I guess it just wouldn't occur to each other to, to negotiate. But would you think that the Night's Watch, I mean, if you think back to the books, they knew that Mets Raider was amassing an army beyond the wall, or at least something strange was going on, and they send a, a delegation of Night's Watchmen out, including John, to to raid, or not raid, sorry, blah, 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 blah. Had a glass of wine, sorry. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, they send the Night's Watch out, they have a big, um, the ranging they call it, yep. and instead of doing it, going to Mance and negotiating with him and say, hey, what's up with all this going on, they send in tiny little hunting parties, essentially, to spy out the camps. Like, again, it just seems like, okay, if the Night's Watch are the more civilised ones, why don't they try and negotiate? Because they don't have the man manpower. Negotiation seems like the only technique they had there. And also, the, uh, like, that's one of the themes of the sort of the plot line. Like, one of the things in the books is just how savage, like, civilised, in air quotes, people can be. And even someone, like, you look at all the civilised uh, lords in Westeros, and they're still going around murdering each other. And the the Easterners and Essos see them as all backwards and barbaric, whereas the, the Westerosi think the same of the people from Essos. And at the end of the day, like man is man can be quite terrible, and civilization doesn't really change our uh, innate desire to result to bloodshed to solve solve issues. Yeah, negotiation is just not a big theme in the books at all. Um, You'd think, or or just like common sense, a lot of times, you'd think the Greyjoys would know that they're not powerful enough to fight the Seven Kingdoms, but they still did it anyways. And it and didn't surrender until it was obviously that he lost two sons and all of its navy. Damn right. <laughs> As I've always said, never count on the Greyjoys to make a sane decision. <laughs> Death before sanity. Yep. Um, yeah, that is, you're, you're right, the, the idea of negotiating. There's so many points throughout the narrative where if both sides would just be willing to compromise, you could avoid so much bloodshed. And the obvious one is yep. the Starks and Lannisters at the, towards the end of the book one. If, if Ned had simply tried to make peace with the Lannisters, years and years of bloodshed could have been avoided. But uh, alas. So um, speaking of North of the Wall, should we move on to Bran and the Reeds? <laughs> <laughs> and Jason and the Argonauts. <laughs> yeah, army of Darkness. Yep. Uh, a group of skeleton whites attack the gang just before they reach the Three Eyed Raven. Uh, Jojen is killed, but the rest of them are saved by firebolt throwing children of the forest who usher Bran into a weirwood tree where the Three Eyed Raven awaits. And he tells Bran that the hour is late, and though he may never walk again, he will learn to fly. So, you guys hated this scene, apparently? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'm coming but... around to just finding it hilariously bad. So is that better? I um I 
uh, yeah, I don't know. I really like this scene. Like, uh, is it that different from what occurs in the book? I'm trying to think. It's, well, there's no, like, direct magic firebomb intervention from the children. I, I, I don't know. Do they use obsidian arrows or something? To... Yeah, why couldn't no. she just use a bow? That would have been so much more less well, shocking. The, in they the were books... whites rather than uh, actual others, so obsidian wouldn't have done much. Yeah, in the Fire books, arrow. she runs out with literally, yeah. like, a, a torch. And they start instead of fighting with swords, she's literally like using a torch as a um, as a path, and they pretty much use the fire to keep the keep them away until they're up into the cave, which makes more sense because you like you're looking at the fight and you go, oh, of course, why wouldn't you just light a fire? Like if you had a fire, you'd be fine. Um, like it makes sense. Whereas in the show, it's like, well, obviously we can't throw fireballs. Like <laughs> maybe it was a Deku nut, like just in Legend of Zelda. Yeah, they, they seemed like bombs to me. Like she, I, I may be grenades. misremembering, but she was yeah holding these little pouches. They were like magic fire grenades. Dumb nuts. Yeah, they seemed like grenades. As she threw them, they would ignite. Yep. Mm. Wildfire? Did the children of the forest make wildfire? Hmm. <laughs> I think children of the forest would be opposite to fire because fire burns trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they got that yeah. icy earth magic. Like the ghost of High Heart hates the fire god, and she's like another apparently, maybe possibly. Okay. Yeah, everyone yeah, else yeah, burst what? out laughing when Jojen got shanked. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's just lying there like, whoops, what's happening to me? Oh, I'm being stabbed. It was slightly comical the way it just kept going in. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so first of all, he died as he lived, which was not doing anything particularly useful. And second of all, it was like uh, D&D's way of just saying like, fuck you book readers, we'll do what we want. And if we want to murder someone early, we'll murder someone early. Deal with it. And I just, I, that combined with the army of darkness skeletons, the scene, I enjoyed it, but it was way more comical than serious for me. Yeah. I, do, I do love the fact that, like, for two seasons now, we've just had Bran and Co. sort of pottering around at camps, doing nothing. And then in the final scene, it's like battle of castle grayskull fireballs and skeletons <laughs> bursting through ice and it's just the craziest thing you've ever seen on the show i don't know that just made me laugh yeah it totally was a jolt of yeah. lightning just like whoa did not yeah. expect this and then going into the the tree and it's like carcosa from true blood and it's so creepy and there's <laughs> skeletons everywhere and you got this tree wizard it's i don't know it's just like this complete <laughs> rupture of just banality for two seasons and then this complete rupture of fantasy i don't know it, it sort of i thought it was effective <laughs> Attention, uh, I just, uh, am I the only one who watches. got really angry that they killed Jojen? I'm, I'm really mad too, don't worry. I feel like they, I mean, they brought in Jojen, what, season three? So they brought them in late, um, and then Jojen was, what, in his visions and said, we have to go north, and then they go north, and then he keeps saying, we have to go more north, we have to go over the wall, we have to go north, and then we he We have dies. to go the northest. They keep going north, and then... The north wall. <laughs> and then, and then that's it, and then they kill him off. Like, he had no purpose. Um, I mean, even in the books, at least you have some sort of emotional connection to him because you've been about, around him a bit more. In the yeah. in the books, he tells a couple of stories to make you care about him in his story. Um, he has that sort of tragic storyline going on where, you know, today's not the day I die. And then but in the book, in the show, it's just he says you have to go north and then dies. And dies in just such a crap way. It's not like he sacrificed himself so Bran could grow up. He was lying there, like, leave me behind. And Mira's like, okay, and off, he, off she goes. It's such a shame they wasted different. them because the actors are really, I, don't, I, I really like them. Um, they could have had so many scenes, even if they're not doing anything, but of them just telling stories. Because that was kind yeah, of the forgetting about so the mythology of the Yeah. This storyline, but they just really took it nowhere. It's just, oh, they're walking, oh, they're walking more north. And that's it. <laughs> now we're going to kill someone because we need to kill someone in the scene because otherwise you guys will say, but it didn't matter. Like, we have to kill someone in every battle that you care about because otherwise it won't be realistic. But it's like, no, just stop, just do something better with your characters, except aside from hiring them and then killing them off when you need a shock factor. I'm pretty sure I saw two like worker children dragging Jojen's body into like a meat grinder, so he's like Jojen Pace now. <laughs> yeah, any Jojen Pace believers here? Yep. I <laughs> definitely. I actually see this as a confirmation of Jojen Paste. Because I, I think at really the happy. end of Dance, he's yeah. dead and he's pasted. And I think D and D know this and they don't want to have a cannibalized children to get magic powers subplot. I just think they don't have the stones for it, because it's 
cannibalize children to gain magic powers. It's ridiculous. That would be such uh, a poor taste. Poor taste. Yeah, and so they'll just shank him nice, quickly, and cleanly and forget about him and just, ah, oh, Bran just ate tree things. Yep, moving on. <laughs> Nothing sus here. <laughs> it bothers me that this pretty much confirms that he's dead in the books, I guess. And I didn't want that confirmed till. Well, we knew he was going to die. It, it, well, it's just the when is still ambiguous. We're all going to die. Yeah, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's well. He's still I'm pretty right. sure he's dead. You, you know, he's not g- going to do anything really important anymore in the books. Cause yeah, I think I hate off. that more. That even though they kill them off, sure they might be still alive in the books, but they won't be doing much because we know that there's not going to be a you know a last minute save the day moment for that guy where he turns the whole story around, is there? Jojen's not going to turn out to be anything particularly storyline changing because, well, they obviously didn't think to keep him around in the show, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah I see where you're going by his death. Just cuts off all potential story options. Yeah, I mean, it, does, it doesn't bother me too much because I, cause I, I believe in the Jojen Pace theory, so I think he's dead in the books already. But I just really... That's the kind of stuff I'd like to find out by the books and not by the show. And this is kind of the point that made me decide that I'm definitely not watching the next season. Not a fan of Wizard uh, Blood Raven with his beard. He looks like Gandalf. That's not how I imagined it. <laughs> he's he's, he's yeah, like an old guy sitting in a tree. A thousand eyes yeah, yeah, it was... <laughs> what's up with that? I, don't, I mean, and whatever. I, was... I mean, with that part, whatever. But he just looks needs to look a little more than just a, a guy sitting in a tree, I think. Was there even just... a yeah. going through him, you know? Like, uh, yeah. Uh, just make him look somewhat not like an old guy sitting in a tree. <laughs> that shouldn't be yeah. that hard. Like, he always, when I picture him, he seems more tree than man. Like he's right. a face and a bunch of features sticking out of bark as opposed mm-hmm. to, yeah, just a dude essentially with like branches along his arms and sitting in a tree, which is what they did. Like, it's not, yeah, go not check impressive. out some of the art. It's, it's messed up of Blood Raven. Yeah. But it does bother me. The eye thing bothers me because he even says that line with a thousand eyes and one. If he didn't say that, it would be okay. But he can't have two eyes and then still say it. That just yeah, doesn't work. really good with, like, little sight. Like, they put in, they sprinkle little details from the books that only book readers will pick up. And they're normally yeah. good with that, but they just completely drop the ball this time. And they could have they could have just left that line out, and then I, I'd still be annoyed, but it wouldn't be quite as bad. Hmm. Yeah. Didn't really bother me. Um, yeah, I just, I, I thought his delivery was really cool and creepy and, uh, He's a good actor. Yeah. It had an mm-hmm. otherworldly kind of quality to it. And the, just the imagery of the, the bones littering the floor and the, the vines creeping all around him was sufficiently eerie that, uh, yeah, I thought it was good atmosphere. It could look I a little bit sad to... about George and Dive, though. Friends like, oh, I'll oh, be able to fly. <laughs> yeah, he's so, <laughs> he's so pumped about flying. He's forgotten about his friend. Yeah, I <laughs> feel like right that could have been much better if if they if if they had a little bit more time, just a couple like a couple more seconds even to give Bran a chance to react to Jojen's death and to react to the fact that he won't be able to walk because, and I I I think in the books that really bothers him and he gets really upset when he is told that he won't be able to walk again yeah, after he he's told that he can fly. Cries like a yeah. bitch. <laughs> But I feel like in the show, he didn't have enough time to react to either of those two things. Yeah, and so, even Mira is kind of just standing there, and they've said, you know, they've made, you know, Jojen's whole role was to get Bran to Blood Raven so that he can fly. Good for him. Like, but Jojen died. He, he gave up his life so another kid could, could walk again. Like, what is that? No. And I think that this is pro- this is speculation for the books, really, is after hearing Jojen Paste, I just assumed that Mera would find out and try to stage some, like, attack on Blood Raven, and Bran would have to do something to stop her. And I think, like, the same thing's there. Like, you can see how show Mera could quite easily blame Blood, uh, Blood Raven for getting uh, her brother killed. And well, also, nothing. how they're killing the skeletons was not very effective. It was a very bad way of trying to kill skeletons with, what, their swords? Well, the skeletons weren't that useful either. Like, there were the two of them on Hodor, and one of them was just kind of gently bonking them with his hammer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, this was all compounded by the fact that I literally rewatched the, uh, uh, like, the, the, the Evil, Evil Dead uh, trilogy, like, just a week ago. And so I had Army of Darkness just really fresh in my mind because I had only watched it, like, three or four days beforehand. And the moment I saw them just bursting out of the ground, I just, I couldn't take them seriously. (laughs) 
because they look almost exactly the same as they do in that movie. And in that movie, they're just incompetent, bumbling skeletons. So I've seen comparisons to the Pirates of the Caribbean skeletons, which I thought was pretty accurate. Yeah, I wish they'd gone the Jason and the Argonauts route, where it's like stop motion. It looks <laughs> creepy. I like it. <laughs> I'm really surprised we saw skeletons, not just four guys in zombie makeup. You know, like surely that would have been cheaper. I, I and guess scarier. I reckon it would have been scarier seeing dead bodies emerging out of the snow to kill them. Skeletons is just it's too far. Yeah, yeah it's just yeah, very uh, very tropey. I mean, the the fantasy yeah. in the show is pretty low at the best of the times. You can kind of you can kind of believe dragons because they feel like an animal, just a sort of um, supernatural mm. animal. And zombies kind of, I don't know, we were sort of maybe a little acclimatized to zombies in pop culture, but walking skeletons does have a like intrinsically comical look to it. Yeah. But it's also the, idea was the, they shows, just, the shows establish, think. though, that right from the beginning, that you die and you can come back as a wife straight away. Whereas mm. skeletons, it's just, it's, it's a leap. You have to go, well, then how long can they be whites for? And, like, I think it's, they have an established scary thing, which is whites. And then they've changed it and said, well, let's make them skeletons too. And, you know, that's that's not scary for me yet because I'm not scared of them. I might be now, but to see them pop me out, I wasn't dreading it. I, mean, I think skeletons... the idea was just that... Uh... They're, that they're so far north is that they just haven't been humans up there in so long, and that any yeah. whites that are in the vicinity have just long since rotted. It's just yeah. skeletons are such... They're in every single RPG that you play, fantasy RPG that you play. You always kill them. So they, they, just, they, just, they just lose any sort of cool factor and just... Uh, they're always like just... low-down mooks. They're never yeah, like they're bosses. Exactly. They're they're just, they're, yeah. And when they, when they die, it sounds like a strike in bowling. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so shall we move on to Maureen? <laughs> okay. Go, just go. Just, go. So do we have to? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so in, in her throne room, Daenerys is presented with the body of a dead infant burnt by dragon fire. Drogon has fled, but she is forced to chain her other two children in the city catacombs. So Danny was not nearly upset enough for what happened. <laughs> I think it might just be more of that uh, internal monologue versus external stoicism that we discussed a couple podcasts back. It's just hard to show it in a visual media. Yeah, I think she was trying to repress it. That's what I got. Yeah, but it just it just felt like it's supposed to be this huge shock, and she just kind of like pouts a little bit. No, well, I'm gonna have to. Okay, I don't know. I felt like that scene with the slaver was really good, but the slave I like the slaver more than Danny. <laughs> was, that, was that supposed to be the point, though? Was I supposed to like him more than her? Uh, I, yeah, I think so. I think it's showing there's a lot more complexity to this issue than Danny thinks. She yeah. thinks of herself as like this savior, but in reality, the society she presumes to govern is much more complex than that. Yeah, I'm really glad we got the, the slaves that wanted to sell them back into slavery. Cause that was, yeah, that really points out the whole yeah inverse thing. Yeah. I also laughed that um, that she came up with the decision on the fly. She's like, oh, yeah, well, you can sell um, yourself back in the slavery for, oh, yeah. And then that's the decision. Like, you're allowed to think about it. Can't can't he just be a servant? Why does he have to be a slave? Yeah, yeah can't he, he just get paid Why can't he just go and work for him? And, like, Maybe you yeah. shouldn't make these decisions on the fly, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything's like three seconds of deliberation. <laughs> and Barrison's like, what about, oh. You've already made a decision. Barrison's entire role in the show is just to like gingerly lean over and whisper something and then like lean back. He does yeah. nothing else. <laughs> and looks disappointed when idea. Daddy nope, disregards nope, nope. his advice. And then tisk tisk in the background. He does nothing. <laughs> well, he got told off once for dissing her in public, so never again. <laughs> he, re- he remembers. He's nothing <laughs> but loyal. <laughs> you and... told me not to talk back in front of anyone else. Well, you know what? I'm not going to talk back ever. And there's just no like discussion of. Um... Jorah, like, uh, we didn't see any of that. Like, she sends him away, and then that's it. Uh, I don't know, it's just this... She's just like a marble statue. There's no insight into her character whatsoever. Yeah, I would have liked the scene with Jorah, just, like, travelling around, just be like, where? I miss you, Khaleesi. <laughs> yeah. I can wait for that. I wouldn't have mind a scene, minded a scene where she's sitting in her room going, oh, man, you know, I sent Daria away. Jorah, I sent Jorah away. Um... Yeah, now what? Or even maybe a scene where she goes out into the city she's conquered instead of hanging out in her pyramid all the time. Because I'm kind of bored of the pyramid. It would be nice to see more of Marine. 
It's just a matte painting at this point. It's just like a little picture outside her window. There's, we'd have no sense of the city's architecture and people and its everyday life. All we see is this completely cavernously empty throne room and people coming in in drips and drabs. And that's how we're supposed to interpret how the city works. But it's, it's, they haven't fleshed it out in the way they did King's Landing or even Calf to an extent. Yeah. I'm hoping that that will be a plot point for next season. That she leave. will spend time learning about the city and going, hey, I've tried to rule this city from a throne room, and the way to rule the city is to go out and be part of it. Definitely. Yeah, certainly for season five, they've got that opportunity to like expand. I mean, we'll see Daznak's pit next season, I hope, which will be cool. Yeah, and she'll get married next season, hopefully. Hopefully they'll go there. Oh, yeah, they have to. Yeah, but they haven't done a lot with Marine's politics yet. I mean, we haven't had the shave pate, we haven't had Krasnys, we haven't had any of the, the Green Grace, we haven't had any of those political characters of Marine. I, I don't know if it, whether it's because they want to simplify Marine or whether they're just lazy. I think they're wary of trying to overload the the TV viewer with information and characters. Like they're always simplifying things, and it's annoying from a book perspective because so much of the enjoyment of the books is all the complexity and political machinations but i think they are just holding a lot of that um politics and may reign over till next season so this season was the conquering and next season will be the ruling you really get the feeling that they have a real low opinion of show viewers like the, uh, they I, just I treat so, yeah, them like, like they over. have the intelligence of goldfish and they mm. can't be treated with too many details or they'll overload and stop watching. They've also forgotten that a lot of people binge watch the show. I know people that don't watch until after all the episodes there because they watch it all in one go. And I know people go back and watch it and they kind of forget that for a lot of people in the long run, you won't think, oh, I didn't understand what happened because I can't remember a couple of seasons ago. They'll watch the show again and be like, well, it was right there in front of me the whole time. I, that's how people are viewing TV these days. They're watching it all in one go, or they're going back and watching a whole season through once it's aired on TV. And they're they're, treating, they're forgetting that people do that. And when they're creating seasons, they're they're thinking that people would watch it once and never again. I feel that's how they you tell a good TV show is that it doesn't aim to please week by week. It aims to please over a season long arc. And when you when you binge watch it after the fact. The episodes should really flow from each other, and I haven't binged watched the season yet, but I, I don't think it'll do that quite well. I think some of the things are just a bit jumpy and sporadic. Yeah, it feels like a collection of really big moments that aren't necessarily tied together by a cohesive narrative the way previous seasons did. Yeah, or an interesting story. They kind of hit all those beats where they need to, but they don't give you a reason to care about why they're going to those places. I mean, we'll get to it later with Tyrion killing Tywin and it kind of happens but at the same time it's it's not the same because they've kind of gone right now he's having a trial now he's been sentenced to death now he's been released now he's killing his father and they don't really take the time to show us where Tyrion's headspace is because oh. because it's not interesting but they they did all those fan favorite moments but they kind of missed the spark that it has in the books you can argue that they tried that with the beetle scene and show him being more cerebral uh, and depressed. And yeah, just like sorry. that, like people watching just were automatically repulsed. And so the very fact they re reacted so negatively to the uh, downer, cynical, thoughtful Tyrion doesn't give me much faith that they'll keep him for the uh, next season, like in the books. Yeah, well, we'll get, we'll get to... Are we up to King's Landing yet? Or did we, did, we didn't really talk about Danny's dragons, did we? So yeah, she locks him in the catacombs and... Uh... I mean, it's a pretty short scene with in Mayrine, but I guess is that kind of the metaphor for Danny being locked, having to be the breaker of chains, locking her in dragons in uh, in shackles. Yeah, and being no, I liked it, but yeah, <laughs> shackled to Mayrine when we all wanted to go to King's Landing. <laughs> you know what else was short? The chains that she chained used to chain the dragons. Those dragons could barely hold their heads up. That's how short the trains were. That was terrible. Such a big room, too. <laughs> and, and they've got these tiny little two-meter-long chains. They're big dragons. Like, but dragons aren't smart. They're going to get like wound around in little figure eights around those pillars, and they'll <laughs> actually just, like, completely destabilize the up. foundations of the city. <laughs> the whole pyramid just collapses. <laughs> now, that would be a marine plot line I can, I can agree with. Uh, the dragon's crying, though. She left. Broke my heart. It's like it's like it's like leaving my puppies. It's so sad. It's like stop crying, please stop crying. And Danny's just stone faced because she has no feelings. Nah, she well, was crying fire breathing child murdering puppies. Keep in mind. <laughs> <laughs> but 
they cry. They cry like regular animals. And I don't know. I, I, I felt something then. And then Danny had, you know, fake tears running out down her face. I'm like, oh, girl, spare me. <laughs> God, you hate Danny. <laughs> I just I just don't like her portrayal. I mean, I feel like for the last five episodes, we haven't even seen her, what, crack a smile, show, you know, some genuine sadness. You know, it's just, it's just been the stony face. And yeah. it yeah. doesn't resonate with me. I agree. I think it's a mix of performance and writing. They're just not interested in Danny's weaknesses and psychology. They just want to show this kick-ass female action hero. Yeah, the thing about Danny is, like, she's still a teenager and she has that sort of fun streak to her, but it's only after she goes on her spirit walk at the end of a dance that, like, all that gets burnt away. So, like, in season six, that would be the time to have her be all stony and badass and stuff, but not now. It felt like a light switch being flicked on. It, it, we, like, season two, she still felt like a regular teenage girl. Then season three, she's in queen mode. Yeah, and but if you think about this, scenes and dance where she's throwing fruit at people in the middle of court, you know, she, <laughs> you know, she, she really does. Exactly. And Zaro's she, and Doxus's jeweled nose. Yeah, exactly. She's, she's, you know, joking around. Can you imagine this Danny causing a public display in the middle of the court with Daria? Probably not, because she's too stony-faced and queenly. Yeah. And you want emotion about anything. And, like, that's half the fun with Danny in the books, is that, you know, she's got these moments where you're like, oh, Danny, no, that's that's not appropriate at all. Oh. Um, and we won't have that in the show because she's the perfect little queen. Yeah, they, they really should have tried to give her the opportunity to show some emotion in the last couple of episodes. Because ever since Daria left, the she hasn't really seemed to feel anything at all. Yeah, well, she just hasn't had any personality. And I think yeah. that's that's the problem, is that she hasn't, like, we had that scene with her braiding the Sandy's hair, but it wasn't even her showing personality and being joking around and giggly. It was more about yeah. her being, I'm a know-it-all. I mean, you think about her in the first season when she was with Drogo, she had a lot of those scenes where she was, you know, joking around with Drogo and and talking to her handmaidens and even in season two when they were um when they first get to car and you know showing them dra- burning the food with their dragons and it was like you just had those per- the, her personality was still there and i think it's all gone now because they're trying to make her the perfect queen and and everyone loves her because she's the dragon queen so yeah i mean that's kind of it's easier for the books though because you do get to read her thoughts and everything um, which is why I think it's even more necessary to include those moments in the show where she can show that. Yeah, I wish they still had the Handmaidens and the Dothraki Blood Riders and those people. It's it's all in, it's a whole new cast from what we got in season one and two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's going to be a real issue in like season five when they have to return to the Dothraki, and she'll be like, "No, I saw some Dothraki with me, but we just never see them." And yeah, it's going to be a bit awkward. Are they? Did the Dothraki do stuff in book five? Did she just send them off to? Like guard a, a territory or something. Well, she has she has like a calisar of like a hundred, um, mm. and like her blood riders, you know, like they always follow her around, and like she always imagines herself as still a Khaleesi, but mm. in the show it's just like, nah, I'm done with the Dothraki. I think the last time we saw them was episode one of season three, when they're on the ship vomiting. So maybe they all died. Maybe she traded them as a Sully. Dothraki <laughs> guard in the throne room. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure that's what happened. I mean, they did offer. I'll give you one unsullied for all your uh, all your Kalisa. and she was probably like, "I'm done." And she gets her dragons back. It's like, "Oh, you can still keep them." They're probably Kalisa. still on the ship, waiting for her to return. <laughs> <laughs> oh, still dear. throwing up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any more to say on Marine? Nope. Okay. So King's Landing. Start with Cersei contracting the talents of Maester Ka- Kyburn to keep Gregor Clegane from succumbing to Viper Venom. She then confronts her father with the truth about her relationship with Jaime, swearing that she'll expose Tommen's illegitimacy if Tywin tries to marry her off again. Afterwards, she meets Jaime in the White Tower and declares her love for him. Jaime casts the Book of Brothers to the ground and they make love on the table. Ugh. Sorry. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like, you, you see it, and it's like, ah, oh, two attractive people making out. Wait, no, the siblings. Oh, uh, no, bad. <laughs> no, the gross bit was pushing the Book of Brothers on the ground. <laughs> do you know how would yeah. ever do that? Yeah, nitpick, nitpick. Oh, yeah, character books, assassination like, no, not aside. Here, we can do it in the set, but not here. 
Yeah, very, very much a nitpick, isn't it? I don't know how I feel about Cersei telling Tywin about their relationship. I feel like it's just not something they would do. Well, it seemed like it was that that nice mixture of Cersei being really, like, manipulative and, like, forceful and also, like, slightly crazy because she, like, played the one hand that she really should never play. But it was also quite tactful because she knew it would work because Tywin's Tywin. He's not getting many Father of the Year awards. I did like the scene, but I, but I just feel like it's something that doesn't make any sense for Cersei to do. I mean, telling telling Tywin is one thing, but threatening to tell everyone when in the books she goes on constantly about how that would be too dangerous for her children if anyone knew that. Exactly. Like, yeah, they would rise up and, and they would kill the children instantly. So yeah, that, don't yeah. Think about it too hard. Cersei is the sensible Jamie one. The Jamie. One, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we've Jamie even had say. in the show already, they've established where, I swear there was a scene where Tywin said that to get rid of those filthy rumours, you must go out. You. Yeah, exactly. You must go out and have more definitely legitimate children to to cement the fact that they're, you know, you're not sleeping with your brother, pretty much. And so Tywin's already aware of the rumours, so for him yeah, to be all like, no, nope, never heard of it, no, no, no. And when he's talking to Jamie, he's like, you'll have children whose last names are Lannister. Yeah. Mm, that's a point, actually. But, but I just like want to say that out of pain. context, I really liked the scene. Because the acting was really good and everything. And it was the scene was fun to watch. If you, yeah, yeah, if I mean, you forget about the context, it was scene. a great scene. Yeah, Lena Headey was good. But I'm, I really struggled to get a grip on Cersei's like arc throughout this season. Because mm. if, if she was so impressive in, um, I think it was episode five when she's going around shoring up all the judges and she does she seems to come into tywin's side in that scene and say all right you know i'll marry if you if you help me with this trial or whatever the scenario was she wants to be her father's heir so to go so violently against him in this scenario just seems way out of character and it's not really motivated by anything in particular like she like defeated Tyrion in the trial by combat where where has this suddenly come from? What threat to Tommen has materialised to, to motivate this? That's a very good point, because I mean, last time we saw her, she was, you know, as you said, getting Tywin on her side by agreeing to marry, and then she got what she wanted, and then she changed her mind. But what she wanted hasn't really occurred yet. It's not like Tyrion's dead and done and dusted. You know, it's still open to debate, and as Tywin allegedly claims later, he wasn't going to kill Tyrion. So... That episode was so great for Cersei. She showed like such cunning and intelligence in that and willingness to compromise, but also manipulating people to get what she wants. Whereas this episode, she's just become a crazy wreck again. And it's not... Yeah, it throws it all away, all that character development. It's, it doesn't make sense. There's no logical like arc towards this point. Um, and yeah, it just completely undermines her character. I Maybe it you, was Jamie. like a writing difference, like how maybe it was just poor communication by writers. I do like get it. that sense a lot in some seasons that some episodes characters are doing things that c- contradict other episodes through in a, in a single season. Yeah, so it might be like, different like writers interpreting episode, the John, chapters. Like last last episode, John was like, oh, "I volunteer to go out and talk to Mance," and then this this episode, he was like, "I was sent out here." Like, oh, yeah. that really annoyed me as well. <laughs> By who? Yourself. Don't try and blame someone else for your own dumb actions. I sent myself. Well, he he had the wall. He sent himself. <laughs> <laughs> Technicality. Okay. Uh, hmm. So, what were the other scenes? Um, Frankenstein, Gregor. Frank and Gregor. Yeah. I like. I Kyber. like Kyber. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Such, such a like nice me. grandpa figure. Yeah. That also yeah. dabbles in necromancy. It's great. Yeah. yeah he's yeah, that... very different from what I imagined, but I really, really like him. There's a lot of potential there as well. If if she if he becomes like Cersei's confidant next season, as she assumes power and and. Like her spur- spurring off against, sparring off against uh, Marjorie. That could be a nice dynamic in King's Landing, even though they've lost a bunch of cool characters. Cool steampunk um, syringe they had. <laughs> yeah. And those yeah. tubes. What do you think those tubes were made of? Like cat guts or or what? Oh. Yeah, that was yes, my no. interpretation. Yeah, some sort of like organic tubing, essentially. The jars Cause... weren't very clean. I didn't feel no. like they were an adequate vessel for the blood if he was planning on putting the blood back into Gregor which is what I assumed from what he was doing um yeah probably contaminated well it was uh 
It was Pycelle's lab, so he's clearly been doing too much maester aerobics and not enough <laughs> simple lab maintenance. <laughs> I could have done with some screaming from Gregor. He just seemed yes, dead. Yes. <laughs> screaming in exquisite agony, as the books describe it. The yeah. Mountain, another character that they completely underserved. He's like the, one of the biggest, greatest monsters of, of Westeros, and he's just a nothing figure in this in this series. Like, they had so bringing much him down. Like, is... Yeah, they had so much rape in this season, and none of it was Gregor, and sadly that disappoints me because he's supposed to be the. the no, because he's supposed to be like the meanest, ugliest guy out there. If anyone's out there raping people and doing all yeah. those sorts of things, mm-hmm. it's the Mountain, and then we have like random goons. Raping people, and we we don't care. But I think well, that's like, the thing we needed to in s- there. Put it, put a put a character that we're supposed to hate and is supposed to be a long term bad guy. Put him out there doing disgusting things. Don't make it some yeah. random set piece. Yeah, like that. We we kind of needed to see that with Arya from her perspective in the Riverlands. So I guess they didn't really plan ahead uh, for that season. So by the time he he returns again, we have no real connection or association with him, apart from when he cut his horse's head off, which was pretty cool. But that was a different actor. The much grumpier, nastier looking mountain rather than a baby face that they hired. Cuddly. <laughs> Super. <Yeah. laughs> so I guess we're up to the scene then. The yes. So Jamie frees Tyrion from his cell and tells him that Varys has a boat ready to ferry him across the narrow sea. The two brothers hug one last time and Jamie departs. And then Tyrion is about to make his escape, but he changes path and makes his way into the, the Tower of the Hand through a secret passage. And he finds Shay waiting on his father's bed. He kills her with the golden chain uh, he gave her last season. He finds Tywin himself in the privy and threatens him with Joffrey's crossbow. Tywin swears that he would never allow his son to be killed and calls Shay a whore whose life and death are meaningless. Tyrion kills him and then meets Varys, who stows him safely away on a shipping container. <laughs> so, so the so, escape with so Jamie that was so rushed. It happened in like a minute. He's like, oh, I'm here. Oh, I'm getting you out. Okay, bye. Exactly. It was so rushed. We hadn't seen this character in two episodes, and all of a sudden he's being freed after we just saw him being condemned to death. Like the actual scene with him and Tywin, I I didn't mind. I thought it was sort of well acted and all that, but mm-hmm. there was it was so rushed. We didn't get any feeling of the situation. No lead up. It's, yeah, it's like stapled in, in the last five minutes. The, the thing that probably bothers me even more than Taisha is that um, is that Tyrion didn't tell Jaime that Cersei fucked everyone because that's not that's going to be another. How, where are they going to take Cersei and Jaime from here? Because if Cersei is the one, if if Cersei is like, ah, oh, let's just tell everyone, and if Jaime has no reason to have any problems with her, then what's the pro- Like, what 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 problems are they going to have? Why would they ever? And that's a good point because we had Lancel. They introduced yeah. it, and yeah. then another character that they've forgotten about and they're just not using anymore. And yeah. again, it annoys me because you know they made a big point of it in season two that Tyrion yeah. was blackmailing Lancel because he knew about him sleeping with the queen. And then and like now it's just nothing. I feel like that's even more important than Taisha because at least up to up to the point where we are in the books, that really hasn't had a big impact on the story, I guess. I really would have liked to see the whole Taisha conversation and everything, but I don't think it changes the story significantly. But the, the whole the whole Jamie Cersei thing is really important, I guess. So that bothered me way more. Yeah, again it's it's a it seems like they're just constantly simplifying things. Like he kills his father and Shay for sentencing him to death rather than the far more yeah, psychologically traumatic thing about his yeah. past. Like that's all so so such a rich part of his character and it's something we've dealt with as book readers throughout the whole story and it's it's so closely tied to his relationship with Shay and his like twisted demented like feelings of love towards her that are displaced from Taisha and it's just all like dissolved because they don't think book readers can handle that and they brought it up in season one and two and yeah, they just yeah. didn't return to it all they needed was like a couple of lines um mm. after Shay like uh, the Beatles scene yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That they well, the, the perfect that. the perfect in was um after the trial when he says I fell in love with the whore. He could have just said again, and then maybe Jamie says something, and then yeah, it's left there. And then they bring it up again in this scene. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't understand the reason. I guess it's just too. It, maybe TV viewers be like, why are they bringing this up again? It's irrelevant. You know, we 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 don't know who this Tysha is. We have no connection to him. So they just want to simplify the motivations to purely the fact that Tywin wanted to kill his son, and they have such a a horrible relationship, maybe. But, but they've brought up, they've even brought up Taisha 
indirectly a lot of times. There's times where they've kind of, I mean, I think Tywin's like you're you're getting married, and he's like, I've already been married, and Tywin's like, mm. like they brought it up. Exactly. Yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, it just seems it's another one of those things where they've set something up and then they've gone, oh, we don't have time. They just bailed. Yeah. It, bailed I think it is that. that lack of communication between the writers like each adapting a different set of sets of chapters and interpreting but they're all adapting the same damn book yeah but they have to pick <laughs> and choose what details to include and i guess yeah. D&D. well I, who's the brian cogman he's like usually my favorite writer because he does the book faithful he tends to include a lot of those details whereas D D tend to just smooth everything out to the basic like you know big moments big yeah. moments and boobs <laughs> yeah yeah um, so I how looked did you it guys... up and uh, oh, yeah. uh, I looked up the uh, the writing and who did what. And most of the episodes this season are by uh, D and D. They did. Yeah, uh, surprising. Martin ah. did two. Cogman did four and six, and Benny Off and Weiss did the rest. So mm. yeah, like I don't know, maybe they're not communicating with each other, or maybe it's what we said earlier about how they're Which focusing ones... more on episode to episode. Which ones did Cogman do? Sorry. Uh, Cogman did. Oathkeeper and Laws of Gods and Men. And uh, by the way, uh, credit to Dragoncast. I'm totally pinching this off their show notes. <laughs> Good pillage there. Like, <laughs> crack them. Yeah, we yeah. pay the iron price take for our information. <laughs> you, leave, you leave it open, you deserve to have it stolen. <laughs> Defend yep. your Google Docs with passwords. <laughs> they um, now, whenever they have them, they're just whenever they see a stranger go in, they're just going to rush delete everything and wait till the stranger leaves before pasting it back. <laughs> so, how did you guys feel about the change in Shay's death? Ooh, I mean, I'm not happy that it was self-defense. It was fine Shay on its own. Reaches yeah. for the knife first, and then it's like, oh no, it's not Tyrion's fault. He's just trying to protect himself. Ugh. Yeah, I saw that as she saw the murderous intent in his eyes, like no. sort of. <laughs> yeah, there is this sort of is thing, like angry? when someone's someone's going to attack you and someone's going to cause you serious harm. Like you can quite often tell by just the look of aggression at them, and especially like uh, earlier in this, like the earlier in the show where we get her being all like rough and tough, and I would I would stab someone for Sansa. Like she's clearly been in some rough places and. She may well have a knack for knowing when someone's about to kill, like about to attack her. But yeah, no, like it's it goes with everything in the show on its own. I think it's fine, but but I, I feel like some sort of conversation, if, even if it was broken. I mean, I think it, someone on the forums posted the actual scene from the book, and she she begs for her life. She says, you know, it wasn't my fault. They made me do it. You know, I please help me, your father scares me, except, and, and even just something along the lines of they made me do it mm. would have been enough for us to be, for Tyrion to take the blame for the murder, even if she did go for the knife, because yeah, then you'd go, he knew, he knew that it wasn't black and white and he still killed her anyway. Yeah, that's, you're right, that would have been way more impactful and especially darkening his character, yeah. Oh, yeah. They I, wish, I wish they'd done that, yeah. Shay's murder was always the more, yeah, reprehensible one. Like, Tywin, you can understand that. But, yeah, Shay's just not totally innocent, but she's just been caught up in this mess, really. Well, that was book Shay. And TV Shay, she definitely seemed like more of an active participant. Like more oh, of the, yeah, uh, I guess that's... Well, yeah, there's all the arguments about how the degree to which she was, but there was definitely that lover spurned angle and how she was actively trying to see him punished for uh, pushing her away. Yeah, and I just don't like that either because, again, that's still not a motivation for Tyrion killing her, but it's, like, it's still a poor motivation, but at the same time, like, people will justify it. And I'm, I'm, I wish that the showrunners were brave enough to make us hate Tyrion because... He's been wait, riding on such a wave of popularity. I've heard people say that if they kill Tyrion, they'll stop watching. And, of course, the show's like, well, we've got to keep this good thing going. We've got to make people love Tyrion. But I wish they were brave enough to make us hate the character that we love most. In the books, it was very... Um, Tyrion was a bit unhinged, but he was really angry and vindictive. Whereas in the show, he looked like his eyes were just kind of vacant and he almost was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And, yeah, just sort of just trying to make, oh, it's okay. It's not Tyrion's fault. Why yeah, he didn't know what he's my... doing and it was an accident and he's going to regret it later and you're going to feel bad for him instead of him being like, no, this is my actions and this is what I did and I killed my father. I'm a yeah. father killer and that's who I am. Like, he won't, he won't have to retake responsibility later because he acted as though 
it, he was driven to it rather than an active choice he took. Oh well, yeah, that yeah. becomes a big thing in the books. Is a sort of denial of his family, like how the one family member that's shown him any level of love or respect is Jamie, and he held the Taisha secret from him all his life. And with that straw, like that's one of the big driving factors for him killing Ty. And it's like, well, I will be a kin slayer because my family deserves to die. And that's why he goes through all dance saying, I'm going to rape Cersei when I take King's Landing and all sorts of nasty things because he just becomes that unhinged by Taisha. Like, it's hard to see how they're going to make him so dark without the Taisha uh, secret driving him. Yeah. I was always hoping that this would be the, the, the moment yet where he plunges off and like the, the showrunners were just trying to make him so light so that when he went dark it would be a contrast, but it doesn't seem to be the case. I'm nervous. I guess they could just use Jay the same way if he keeps if he keeps thinking about her and how she betrayed him. I, I, I it simplifies the whole thing, but I guess it could still work. I don't know. One thing I'm really glad about is that they didn't resolve the whole issue what Shay is doing in Tywin's bed because I was worried they'd spoil that as well yeah, yeah they seem to sex. know like when I, I, I'm pretty sure I remember something along the lines of Terry was like uh, I killed her back in there and he's like oh she was just a whore like I got the feeling that that was played straight and it was Tywin banging Shay yeah, yeah he, di he didn't see her as a person he just saw her as a whore and Tyrion so used her and he used her as well. It's um so and sick, like in Tywin. He's Ty taking his son's leftovers. Tywin and the, no, but it feels like it's almost like it's this sick sexual kind of competition between him and Tyrion. Like he had to defeat him in every single possible way. He had to destroy him physically. He had to take his whore. He had to like the relationship between him and his son is so demented and weird in the books. And so the more you the more you learn about. Tywin, like, he starts off incredibly impressive and Machiavellian, but the more you get in there, the more you learn about the things he's done, his his possible ordering of the mountain to do what he did. It's like something really dark and horrific underneath all that kind of uh, glossy veneer, I guess. So what do you think happened in the in the books? Do you think that um, that Varys planted her there, or that, they, that Tywin actually slept with her, or what do you think was going on in the books? I'd say both almost. Like, uh, I think Shay... Barris knew Tywin was banging Shay, and so he made a point of just putting Tyrion in a position to uncover this. Oh, okay. You think Varys sort of arranged that? Yeah, well, like he, he saw he could yeah. exploit this. Yeah, because Martin's... the other day I read, the, I read that interview and I can't find it right now, so I can't find the exact quote. But, but they, they interviewed Martin about that scene, and he said, he said something like, it's also possible that Varys has something to do with it. That's what yeah. Martin said. So. There's things about that particular incident that haven't been fully revealed yet, particularly Varys's part. So possibly he had... I mean, it's quite... He sort of obviously, even though he says don't do it, he pretty obviously directs Tyrion on yeah. the specific route to find the, um, his father's bedchamber. Yeah, he's like, fourth door on your left. Yeah, it's got a little... <laughs> note, note <laughs> he's I put across there for you. Steps up, se 17 steps up, then feel around, like, really specific. But in the show, he just kind of pops out of the floor. Yeah, yeah, that bothered me as well, that Tyrion just knew how to how to get there. Right, in the and show, I... it's all Tyrion's decision, yeah. 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 What did you guys think of afterwards? So Tyrion goes out and gets in a box and then Varys hops on the boat with him, but not in the box, next to the box. I love that scene. Yeah, this was, this was great. Absolutely gorgeous, him looking at the castle in the darkness and just sits next to this box. And his expression is amazing and the music, oh, brilliant. I did find it a bit hypocritical that he put Tyrion in the box, though. He's like, you have to don a box. And then imagine Tyrion getting out of the box and be like, you rode all the way over here, like on a chair. And I had well, to go gave him box. some air holes. <laughs> Like, are you kidding? Nice you could symmetry. have told me that was an option. <laughs> it was nice symmetry with how Varys had, like, the guy that castrated him shipped to King's Landing for his own personal torment. It was sort yeah. of a way to say, oh, uh, maybe yeah. Varys's interest in Tyrion isn't entirely altruistic. Like, maybe there is an element of just sheer practicality of having a crazy, vengeful, clever dwarf on your side. And contrast that to the way... Uh, Tyrion arrives in King's Landing in this honor guard at the beginning of season two, him being taken out in a box like like garbage at the end of season two. In Varys' special people box. Well, this is my person box. Yeah. <laughs> I ordered it special for the wizard, but um, it will work for you too. <laughs> the wizard's like scratched, like help messages on the inside. <laughs> 
What's the actor's name? Connellis Hill. Hill, yeah. I love you, Connellis Hill. I want more of you. He's apparently the funniest actor in the uh, in the series because uh, I've seen a lot of interviews with other actors. It's like, oh, who, who do you like to act with the most? It's like, oh, uh, Connolly Hill is just hilarious. Like, whenever we're not filming, he's just making jokes. And at one point, he even made Sean Bean smile, which just <laughs> amazed everyone. <laughs> Warmed his frozen heart. <laughs> yeah, the, Jam- the Jamie thing is quite interesting. Um, the fact that they leave on uh, a warm note rather than a bitter note, I guess. I, I, I guess we don't really know how that's going to pay off in the books because uh, Tyrion obviously has horrible thoughts and memories and recollections about his sister and his father, but he doesn't really think that much about his brother. And there might be yeah. some pangs of guilt. Even even during that scene, he does feel some guilt when he says, I was the one who killed your wretched son. But uh, yeah. We didn't in even get that, did we? Oh. oh, yeah, we didn't. Well, they did it earlier. They... they uh, it's the problem is Jamie got to King's Landing way too early, so he had a chance to ask about Joffrey and uh, and vice versa. Um, and but in yeah, the book, so there was that, that irony though that Jamie was saving him, and even as he was saving him, Tyrion admits to the crime, and Jamie, you know, still he lets still him go. Still does it anyway, which is so cool. Yeah, it says a lot about the both of them. Yeah. Well, Jamie doesn't really give much of a damn about uh, Joffrey. Like Joffrey. at some point, he says something along the lines of. It was just a squirt of seed in Cersei. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, the Cersei-Jamie relationships kind of, they've backpedaled on that as well because this was the beginning of the end for them, I guess, when he says that she's been unfaithful. I guess next season they might have introduced uh, the Kettle Blacks and that's Bring where she'll, she'll go to them uh, to, to get some of the dirty deeds done that maybe Jamie would have done before his redemption. Um, and I guess maybe Lancel might appear in the Riverlands when Jamie is doing his kind of reconstruction thing, put restoring order to Harrenhal and that, and that's where he might reveal it to, to Jamie. Well, there's many ways for their relationship to fall apart. So, that's, yeah, it'll happen. Which is, yeah, so I say so erratic that it can just kind of go this way and that yeah. way. As we reveal. But yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of their characterizations in this episode, which is a shame because the mo- most of the season, Jamie and Cersei uh, have been quite strong, apart from one particularly terribly executed scene, which was never referenced again. So I, it seems to seems to be the case that it was just really poorly done and, and didn't mean to appear as it did to most people. Actually, yeah, it's, Cersei says, I don't care to Jamie in this episode, which is sort of like a reflection of what Jamie says in that awful scene. So... Yeah, so it very strongly seems to imply that it was not a rape scene, but yeah. Mm. Okay, the last storyline is in the Vale or the Riverlands? It's the Vale. Somewhere vale. around that area. Looks rough. We, haven't, we haven't been in the Riverlands for a long time. Let's face it, the Riverlands don't exist. But the salt pans yeah. are in the Riverlands, aren't they? Well, yeah, well, 10 miles from the bloody gate, so... Yeah, yeah, and it looks mountainous, so... <laughs> is that a word? Mountainous. Oh, it's the word in Australia. Down on genius. I like that. He okay. said it. It's a word. <laughs> Ironborn vocabulary. <laughs> so, Brienne and Podrick stumble across Arya and the Hound in the Mountains of the Moon. Brienne begs Arya to come with her, citing the promise she gave to Catelyn. The Hound calls Brienne a Lannister dog and draws his sword. The two engage in a brutal fight, which ends with the Hound tumbling off a cliff. Arya manages to flee before eventually circling back around to find a dead sense, to find a near dead sensor. Sandor, rather. <laughs> and uh, he tells her to end his wretched life once and for all, goading her with all these horrible acts. She watches him with disgust and then walks away once and for all. I like this scene. I think this, this even though it wasn't in the books, I just liked the whole the whole story with um, Brienne. I, I got chills when Brienne and Aya were talking. Yeah. I just thought, like, it was just so effective where they were talking about something and you're like, oh, she's, Brienne's just so close to figuring it out and Aya's being really mysterious and she's got that look in her eyes, like a curious look, and you just got that spark of Aya, like what she used to be and, you know, talking about her father and, yeah, it's just so good. Like- Common interests and being women that like to murder people. <laughs> I felt like it was unfair of Arya to say that her father wouldn't let her fight or something like that when he was the one who who found Sirio Farrell for her. Oh, he didn't want to teach her. Well, well, he had someone teach her. Isn't that good enough? Yeah, he let her keep her sword and got got in a special teacher for her, but that's not letting her fight. Right? Well, yeah, I thought learn... that was pretty ungrateful. We never learn what Ned's opinion of Sirio is. For all we know, 
Ned literally thinks Serio is some poncy dancy Bravosi that's just going to teach Arya to do cartwheels and rubbish like that instead of actually fighting. <laughs> what did you think of the hound wandering in, pulling up his pants? Mitch. Oh, you can't, you can't have her. <laughs> yeah, it's just such a hound thing to do. It's a like, oh, potentially dangerous situation. Eh, let me finish. I'm in oh, the middle of something like, You can here. do that later. There's people coming. But I liked how you got to see the hound really stand up for Aya and talk some common sense into Brienne. Where's Brienne going to take Aya? We don't know. She hasn't thought about that. She hasn't gotten that far. Well, the hound has, and he knows that there's nowhere nowhere safe to do it. Part of it was he didn't want to be alone. Like he'd, uh, I, don't, I don't know if he liked Aya, but he'd sort of grown somewhat dependent upon her. The, the ransomers like bond with their captors or the people they take? I don't or is it know. just want the other <laughs> way? Reverse Stockholm Syndrome. Oh yeah, like the point of Stockholm Syndrome is like the power thing, and it's because someone has power over you, you grow to like them. But it may work in reverse if you're a uh, that type of person. You may maybe. think having, if you like submissive people, you might grow to attach to someone, maybe. Well, she like stitches up his wounds, and maybe it's like Nighting, what Florence Nightingale think? Yeah. She doesn't stitch it up, she pours water over it because he's too scared of fire. Oh, yeah, well, they do have right. some good moments for him. But I, I'm, that, that makes me wonder what his plans were at this stage. Like, whether whether he was actually planning on taking her anywhere or whether he was just like, okay, let's just wander around and have fun. And well, the yeah, Knights of the Vale let them... Start up a buddy cop show. The day. Yeah. The Knights of the Vale let them wander off. Last yeah, time they saw didn't them, she was having a laugh, laughing fit. And uh, they were like, oh, you say you're, oh, you're stuck and you're clearly the hound. Uh, yeah, okay, off you fine. go. Bye. That was so <laughs> such a blunder like it, it, yeah. if the hound had simply not revealed her to be Arya stark it wouldn't have been a problem but uh, ridiculous i don't know why they made that decision to reveal her identity if they were gonna never have any payoff for that yeah they should have been like, like um hi point. we're visitors we're just um we're just hoping to see um robin of the vale and lysa oh lysa's dead oh can we still come visit robin please please go tell them or get someone down here or like they were just i don't know. well i can understand if um lysa's dead that they would have no recourse because that's the person the Hound was going to talk to and that's probably the only person that would know Arya Stark. I mean, there's no other relatives in there. Sweet Robin's not going to know anything. Um, so I can understand from the Hound's perspective, but if the Knights of the Vale know that it's Arya Stark, there's no way they would have let them go, even if it was just a suspicion. So it makes no sense why they would include that in the script. Yeah, they could have Maybe added one sentence didn't... this episode to, to be like, oh, we had to run away from them. Or like They, they could have tried to come up with some sort of explanation for how they Yeah, <laughs> they had to kill, they, like, they, 40 guys. <laughs> they didn't even bother trying. They were just like, oh, mm, oh whatever. Silly, yeah. Uh... You could argue that maybe the uh, the Vale Knights just didn't want the hassle of having a potential Stark, because, uh, <laughs> like, it's, it's the argument made when... And I don't know who it is, but it's someone learns that the Martells were plotting to marry Aegon. No, uh, marry da- Daenerys... And it's like, well, if Robert knew, he would have he would have brought his hammer down on them. So there's that sort of logic that, well, if we have even a pretender as Arya Stark, maybe the Lannisters, who for all the Valemen know are really powerful and dominant, uh, maybe they would come down on the Vale and things would be bad. And it's just like, well, it could be her, it could not. Let's just not chance our total destruction. Yeah, it's a middle management decision. You didn't want to? You didn't want the hassle? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the hound, the hound fighting Brienne. Oh, this was painful. Listening mm, well, to Brienne, just those yells, those screams. It was a really gritty fight, wasn't it? I mean, a lot of it's usually clang, clang with the swords, but they were getting right in there and smacking each other across the face and kicking each other in the groin, and they were really, it was really down and dirty. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, it was, it was a brawl. It was nice contrast to the the Red Viper's kind of elegance and dancing compared to this just absolute brutality and. And uh, I really liked how it was shot with the, the grey skies and the silhouettes. Um, but yeah, by the end, it was just horrific. The grunts and noises they were making were very, very pained. Yes, well, the, neither of them are knights also. So like, there's just that idea that not all combat is chivalrous and mm. you get people together. Like Sometimes the urge to not die will take over and you'll start fighting on reflex and looking for any little, any little advantage you can get over your opponent and any little way to not die. Yeah, well, it sort of started off somewhat chivalrous, at least from Brienne's perspective, but as you say, the closer you come to death, the less civilised you become. And once they lost their swords as well, it was literally hand combat. It was great. I sort of like that was how Brienne won, was 
she won just by beating the hound down because uh, that's also how she beat Loris in the tourney at Bitterbridge was how she she was being beaten in terms of skill and so she essentially just tackled him to the ground and relied on her strength and that seems to be her fallback it's like well when my training isn't helping I can use my freakish strength to just outpower and just work on reflex and outmuscle my opponent which probably wouldn't have worked on the Hound if he was healthy, but he had a yeah. bad case of a bite wound. So yeah, Speaking of cannibalism, the Hound has been like bitten off chunks of by like two different people. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, tasty. <laughs> she spits it out. Waste. <laughs> um, but, then, but then they kind of, Brian wins by pushing him off the cliff. Did you guys like that shot? There was one shot where it looked like he was falling off a straight up and down cliff. And then it kind of turned out he was rolling down a hill. Yeah, that was confusing, I thought. Cause it doesn't yeah, look I like thought he was, he was just going to splatter when he hit the ground. But, mm. uh, he gets a death soliloquy. Yeah, that was sad. It was very sad. I, I wanted Arya wondering... to kill him. I wanted him to. I wanted her to do it. I didn't care at that point <laughs> because I felt like after that conversation he deserved, he deserved a death. And I know everyone would have cried because it eliminates the gravedigger theory. But I really would have loved that. If I don't she know had what it given him mercy. It's a hard scene to interpret why she doesn't kill him. Um, because they are closer than they were in the books. Yeah, the books. it is a very much a captive. Well, it's not buddy buddy, but there's a there's a sympathy there. Like especially that scene where he's talking about how his brother burned him, and she cleans out his wound. Um, there's more. There's much more of a connection, I think, than in the books where it was very much captive and captor, and. Um, yeah. I guess that the writing more suggests it's almost like Ari is just disgusted by the things he's saying, what he's revealing as he tries to goad her into killing him, that she just doesn't want any part of it, maybe. Actually, no, one, one key line was um, one more name off your list. And I felt like that was them maybe showing that Arya could sort of turn out like the Hound, like she's looking at the Hound and seeing so much rage and bitterness and that drive for revenge that she is slowly seeping into. And she sees like herself becoming that and she... I guess, turns her back on it. I think it's also, there's part of her that in that moment, she hates the Hound so much because he's reminding her why she hates him. And she realised, she's like, no, you don't deserve my mercy. I hate you so much that I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to leave you here to die in agony. I'm not going to give you the gift of mercy. And I think I think that's, that's how it was in the books, that she said, no, I'm not giving you that. Um and she holds that power and walks away. Well, there's a. I think the line in the book is, um, is he says she says you should have saved my mother, and she says I'm gonna leave you and you'll see what wolves do to dogs. So it's really brutal. But I kind of I, I would have liked that. But it's kind of cool that she doesn't say anything as well because her her face speaks so much, her expression communicates so much. So I, I like the fact that it's the hound speaking to someone who's just not reciprocating. Yeah, excellent acting by Maisie Williams. Like, she's doing yeah. so little with her face, but yeah, it's saying so much. It's, it's great. And uh, who plays the Hound? Uh, Rory McCann. Just, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've loved him this whole season. And him just screaming against the uh, against mortality is fantastic. So that was one of the, even though there's some lowlights for this uh, episode, that was one of the highlights, definitely. And Pod, mm. you had one job. One job. Oh my God, Pod <laughs> is the worst. <laughs> I was genuinely go. thinking Pod was going to get shanked by Arya. Like, yeah, he's yeah. a pretty, like, yeah. tertiary character at best, and the moment he went, started chasing after Arya, it's like, oh no, is she gonna kill him? Is but no, he like... was actually going to get a good seat for the fight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought, um, on the forums they were talking about the wolf bread being, like, proof that she's, she's like, helping, Stark she, she's a Stark supporter, and, um, she goes to Pod, get the wolf bread, and he kind of looks around sheepishly, because he's eating it. <laughs> oh, Pod. Podrick Kane. Mm. I just love how he's like, did you chase her? No, I was watching you. Like, w- w- were we helping me? <laughs> I was watching me? a butterfly. No. <laughs> no, yeah. you weren't I mean, he helping me either. Her if he was watching. But, I, but do something. Don't just watch. Either help her or go find Arya, but don't just sit there and watch. Sitting on a rock with some popcorn. It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Podrick. <okay. laughs> um, and then Arya hops in a boat. Yep, this was my favourite scene of the whole episode. Um, just... The, the combination of music and imagery is just so beautiful. Just seeing this little girl riding by herself, like alone for the first time in her life. She wasn't being led somewhere on a chain and she didn't have any family to go back to. Just, yeah. And I love the music. 
Yeah, I loved. I loved. I loved the scene where she was. Um, she negotiated to get on the boat. Um, and just because they have kept that that coin in there, they referred to it in season three, and it's something that's come back from season two. And it was it was just great that that's one of the things that they've done right. They've kept the coin in there. In the books, it's something she's always feeling in her pocket for and thinking about. And in the show, they've managed to keep it in just enough that when she whips it out, it doesn't feel like, oh, yeah, well, that's convenient, isn't it? And just the sense of, like, the, the emptiness of the landscape and how lonely she is on her horse and uh, her looking back at Westeros, just kind of just all of the horrible nightmarish stuff that, that's happened and the fact that everybody she's ever loved has died to the point where Arya Stark doesn't even exist anymore and, and her just turning her back on it like she did the Hound and running to the front of the ship and like looking out, I guess, to the future. And it's so cloudy and, and uncertain, but at least it's, uh, it's a future she decides, for better or worse, at least. Mm. All these scenes with Arya, actually, uh, it fits quite well into my dislike of the character because uh, it's the way that she goes off and it's like, ah, oh, well, I, I'm going to leave everyone, I'm going to run away, I'm going to take a boat. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a boat to Bravos and become an assassin after two people literally beat the stuffing out of each other in her best interest. Like, you could argue Brienne's a bit too idealistic and the Hound is a bit too nasty, but at the end of the day, both of them were fighting for what they believed to be Arya's best interest. Yeah, but she, she doesn't know that. She doesn't know Brienne's motivations. She's seen so many people try and... Like, everyone she's met pretty much this whole season has tried to kill them. She doesn't know Brienne's motivations because Brienne wasn't clear in telling her them, and I hate that. Why don't you just use your mouth and tell the correct story right from the beginning? What could she have said? Escorted Jamie Lannister. uh, Well, yeah, yeah. I escorted Jamie Lannister for your mother because she wanted to trade him for you and Sansa. I made a sacred. I made a sacred oath to your mother that I would trade Jamie Lannister for you girls. And you weren't in King's Landing when I got there, so I was sent out to fulfill that oath with this sword that was made out of your father's sword to go find you and take you to safety. By the time she know... finished that, the hound would have lopped her head off. No, they, had, they had a great big long conversation. It could be, it would have been fine. Yes, yeah. Brienne is just not very capable in a verbal debates. Just no, public just, speaking phobia. She doesn't have Jamie's uh, tongue. No, it's just t- it's just TV plot device, you know. If she could have told the story, the hound would have gone. Well, that's great. Let's sit down and brainstorm why places that we can go because I'm out of ideas. Um, well, and, the, and that would have made awesome a terrible Arya protection episode. Of, I think of that's Jamie it. and the hound fighting together to keep Arya safe. I yeah. think it was more the hound that initiated it. Arya probably would have been more happy to hear her out, but it was the hound that confronted her and um, antagonized her. And, yeah. yeah. I, but also the part of it that he didn't want to give up Arya. Yeah, but they could have figured something out if she had just said what was going on. And, so. but, and then I the think, Hound rejected it. I, the I hound feel had, like if she'd said, been truthful and said the clear truth and the Hound had rejected that, I'd go, okay, but because Brienne wasn't clear because they wrote it poorly, it makes yeah. it seem like, well, maybe they wouldn't have fought if they... Oh, I don't think it. I don't think it mattered what Brienne said. The Hound had made up his mind. Yeah, probably. But but it just seemed. It seemed like she wasn't even trying. I love Brienne screaming Arya, yes. Arya against the mountains. That was just a great transformation from what we were seeing throughout the season. Just the desperation that is going to carry over into next season. It's yeah, great. Um, I love the the Hound's line about unless there's a maester hiding behind that rock. <laughs> Um, oh, Septon. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. Yeah. yeah. Do you think this is the last we'll see of the hounds? Probably. Like, if they'll just be the cameo or just nothing. I think nothing, but it's it's imp- but we don't see his dead body. I think that's what's valuable. We don't see him die, so there's always that possibility that he's out there, even if we never go to the Quiet Isle. Oh, yeah. yeah, I like the golden idea rule of this game. Is, uh, sorry, the uh, the Game of uh, Thrones is that if you don't see a decapitated body, they're probably still alive. Oh yeah. Also, the fact that Brienne and Brienne and the Hound have met would kind of negate that because the Hound would immediately recognize her on the Quiet Isle. Mm-hmm. Round two on the Quiet Isle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just rips off his robes and like draws his sword. And, and Bring it on! You can't, you can't speak. And he's still wearing his full plate armor underneath the robes because he never takes it off. Because <laughs> he, he, he never really rests. Should. Constant vigilance. The Septons like crowd around. Fight! 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 <laughs> 
No, they clap because they can't talk because it's not their day to talk. <laughs> well, is that w- just the one guy going fight, 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 and everyone else is just fist pumping in time with them, <laughs> stamping their hose. So that's season four, guys. Yep, Actually, just quickly, can we talk about the the exclusion of Lady Stoneheart? Because now right. that we've come to the end of the main episode, this would be the good time to discuss Declaring it. Declaring omission, yeah. What did you guys think? Well, I I was a bit disappointed, but I but to be honest, it was rushed enough as it was, and I'm glad they didn't put her in this episode because they would have had even less time for everything so i just don't see how it would have fit in even though i really would have liked to see her i just i just love that final scene so much like we were so used to having the supernatural thing occur at the end of the big event like the dragons or the the zombies the fact that it was such a simple character moment i don't know it's more powerful than seeing a zombie uh, appear again we got the skeletors in earlier so we were had it. I, would I, loved a, I would have loved a cut scene I reckon that would have been really good. Just something at the end of the, um, in the middle of the credits where they stop and they, they show the Brotherhood without banners doing doing something, I don't know, and the person at the back of the, the riding party is Lady Stoneheart. You know, just something really simple to remind us that, hey, the Brotherhood exists, by the way, because we haven't heard or spoken about them all season, and B, Lady Stoneheart, and that, and that would be just a little teaser for the next next season. The reason I'm kind of okay with it is because, and it, it depends on whether they do this or not, but I'd, I'd like to hear like the whisperings about Lady Stoneheart before we actually reveal who it is. Like We keep hearing about this um, woman has taken over the Brotherhood of Banners and is ravaging, pillaging the, the Riverlands and stringing up Freys and Boltons and Lannises, and you hear the whisperings in River Run and, and King's Landing, and then you finally meet her towards the end of the season or Brienne runs into her at the end of the season that, that, that'd that be a cool reveal um, yeah. because they don't have as much material to draw on from book four so that could be a really cool uh, not so much not, not so much material but more not as many big shock moments in book four it's much more about world building and characterization so that could be definitely a, a shock moment for the next season and I think yeah. the number one reason like I was I am really annoyed they didn't include it and for me being really annoyed at the show is, is something something unique i'm normally mildly annoyed i guess with stuff like this but i always saw it as the the bookend of the the first act of the uh the entire series like the uh it starts with the scene of royce what's his name the uh, night's watchman and his two guys and it mirrors the lady stone hut scene quite well and that you just have a bunch of people heading through the wilderness at a very sort of slow plodding pace and then more and more as you get into the chapter, they just have their agency and their uh, ability. Like they, their world is just taken over by the supernatural force, with the first one being the icy force, and the last one being R'hllor, the fiery force, and it culminates in them dying. Like, it's just the symmetry of the two. And since they started with it then, I think they should have ended with it, just to kind of demarcate the, the first act. Well, the problem that they've created is that we've had no brotherhood this season. We've had no phrase this season. We haven't had the Blackfish. We haven't had Edmure. And therefore, all of those storylines have just ceased to exist. And to bring in Lady Stoneheart without a mention of the Brotherhood or the phrase. But those things don't it, exist in the, for the second half of book three, do they? They're only in book four. Well, they don't exist in... Well, they're in book the book three throughout. And I think because it, as a book you have Not it after in the Red there. Wedding. No, but that's the thing that that's how you bring it back and remind. That's how George reminds us that there are still Starks out there who want revenge, mm. and it's long before we get any kind of Norse remembers hints, and that and that's what spurs you on to the next the next book. You go, you know, even though Rob died and they lost the war, guess what? There's still there's still a spark. There's still hope, and it's and it's a creepy scene, but it's that reminder. It's that last little bit at the end that brings you back to remind you that it's about Starks. That's the thing. I, I rather kind of like the fact that we've had a whole season without any mention of the Starks. Their their destruction is cemented at the beginning of the season and their fall is completely established and reinforced. There, There's no mention of their, their return. Um, so I think that's valuable because it shows the absolute repercussions of the Red Wedding. If she had have appeared at the end of last season or the end of this season, it would have negated some of that. So the fact that they've had gone a whole season without the Starks and then next season maybe they can introduce Stoneheart and Blackfish and Manderley and the potential of a Stark resurrection. There's also the fact that the it's... Okay, it's not all about Starks, but 
they've just left out a whole bunch of characters. They spent all last season developing the Riverland storyline and they've just abandoned it. And, okay, the Starks are dead, but there's still a whole bunch of characters that they've just ignored and I feel like that's really poor storytelling, especially if you were they were your favourite. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we'll see the Tullys again, just saying. Oh, no, I think we'll see the Tullys at the Siege of River Run. Um, I would love to do it. That's the major event for Jamie, isn't it? But they're sending him to Dawn next season. Didn't you hear? There's rumours that he'll be um, going to Dawn and fighting (laughs) Obara's band. (laughs) I heard that. I I heard that, but I haven't seen any sources. Like, I assume he'd be replacing Balin Swan and going in lieu of him. Oh, my God. Yes, that's that's, that's (laughs) what I heard. But um, there's an audition scene floating around because they were casting Obara this season. And there's an audition scene fight floating around where he, she fights a significant character, and uh-huh. it's believed to be Jamie. This goes back it to what I said about Jojen and D and D are just like fuck the books. We do what we want. <laughs> <laughs> Does it make sense? No, not really. Is it a waste of everything we've done up until now? Probably. Let's do it anyway. <laughs> Is it gonna look cool as hell? Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do some more coke. <laughs> <laughs> from all the money we've made <laughs> okay Jess you gotta go yeah I'll just do my final thoughts on the season and then you guys can wrap up uh, I guess I like this season I like this season and I think in a month or two I'll probably watch it again and really enjoy it but watching it bit by bit I always find I don't enjoy it as much I'd probably put it on par a little bit better than season 2 but I think I just need to watch them all again and and really enjoy them without nitpicking because I always find that the first go I nitpick too much to enjoy it and then the second go I, I am able to enjoy it as a whole rather than the individual pieces. Great, okay. Thanks cool. for that. That's See right. you later. Catch up, bye. Have a good one, bye. I'm going to go to sleep then because I have to get up and sit Oh, uh, you got to go, Tanya. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, like, mm, I, I, I tried to pick my favourite episode um, and the thing is that in pretty much every episode, there's been something that really, really bothered me. And and there's also been really amazing moments this season, like the trial and over and everything. Um, but there were just so many things that bothered me as well. And I'm definitely done watching after this season till the next book comes out, really, which yeah, is a shame. A lot of people yeah. feel that, yeah. Okay, thanks, Tanya. Um, yep, thank you. Have a good one. See ya. Bing has actually written down his thoughts, so I'll read those out. Um, He says, This is still my favourite season out of all of them. It didn't quite reach the highest heights of my expectation, but it was overall much more consistent in its pacing and delivering big moments than any others. There was no episode that was an absolute drag and pointless. The cinematography and directing was kicked up several notches as well. What about you guys? Thoughts on the season? How would you rank it compared to uh, the first couple of seasons? I was hoping that this would be my favourite season of all time. And I think I might have overhyped it a bit myself. And maybe my purism is coming through, but season one will always have a special place in my heart. So I think... Same, yeah. Ab- above season three and season two, obviously. So second place. Mm. Okay, what about you, Joseph? I I would say I really liked it. And uh, pretty much how I summed up this episode would sum up my opinion of the season, which is objectively, if I was just a uh, goldfish-brained show watcher, I would really... Like, I really enjoyed it it was a lot of fun and it was real good but uh, for the first time like my book purist is starting to creep out and i don't like that i like being able to separate the two but as they kind of make more stuff up i'm getting more and more worried i would in all probably place it as my second favorite season pretty much every second episode seemed to be my new favorite episode but yeah so for me it's it's my second favorite behind season two season two's your favorite uh yeah because i am not that invested in danny or john and most people's issues with season two was how poorly they bungled those storylines whereas i'm more invested in stannis and theon who they executed very well in season two i feel yeah and i agree bungled, that, bungled that, stannis terribly in three which stopped me enjoying three there's yeah. a thre- there's a thread on the forum that yeah pretty much talks about that how low season two was ranked but ultimately yeah if you john and danny were really poorly handled but as you say there's a lot of great stuff a lot of people say remembering back um that 
Blackwater was like the only worthwhile episode of that whole season. But the stuff at Winterfell, the stuff in the Iron Islands, Dragonstone. They were they were all good, strong storylines in season two. Brienne, yeah, Brienne is good. Ah, um, uh, yep, uh, yep. What else? Um, yeah, the yeah. Tyrells. I like too because it had my favorite characters quite centrally featured, which is essentially the same reason I like Feast, even though I'd have to acknowledge it's probably a weaker book. It's just it has more of what I like, so it gets it gets big bonus points for that. And your favorite yeah. characters are Theon and Stannis. <laughs> uh, well, my favorite ones so far. Like I and po- and I was gonna say Yara. The show's getting to me. No. <laughs> that would be my three favorites so far, and most of my real favorites haven't shown up in the show yet. Oh, okay, so you you got stuff to look forward to. That's cool. Well, um, they're all the Grey Joys, and it's looking like they're gonna cut the King's Moot. I feel so. Hopefully, I'm worried for the Grey Joys. You reckon? Uh, that, yeah, yeah, I guess it's hard to I tell. Feel, I realized the other day that they could just have Balon replace Euron as like the force of renewed Ironborn aggression. He just gets a second win and decides to start attacking the Reach and just have Yara replace Victarion and just, okay, you go to Danny and Tamer Dragons for me, your father, because you have daddy issues and will do my bidding. Like, it would fit and they could force it if they wanted to, but I sincerely hope they don't. Yara and Danny, there's a new ship. Ooh. <laughs> I will win her. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, I, I'd probably agree. Um, second favorite season behind season one for me. Season one's not my favorite. I'm probably biased because that's kind of the season that got me into the books. So I'm yeah, always same. viewing at it as a, as a show watcher and it was so impactful. It was, yeah, it's just this amazing thing I'd never seen before. Holy shit. What, Ned lost his head. Oh my God. It's such a brilliant, it's such a brilliant way it draws you in. Because it, it is quite a slow burn at the beginning, but it draws you in mm. and you become so invested in the characters. And then from like episode six onwards, it's just these amazing escalating events. Uh, Ned's execution, the King in the North, Danny's dragons, just fantastic, complete subversions of all your expectations. And it felt far more centralized, far more coherent narrative, whereas it get increasingly fragmented um, from then on. It just feels like a, a collection of different storylines that aren't necessarily interacting with each other, um, which is a yeah. shame. But, but season four, I... I I didn't. I enjoyed the big moments. I think they they pulled off the trial really well. Uh, Oberyn's fight. Oh, the whole character of Oberyn I thought was fantastic. Probably maybe even better than in the books. Um, even though he he had a lot less um, screen time and we didn't necessarily get the backstory with his sister, which was important. But the the performance was so excellent oh, yeah. that you were immediately so Oberyn. drawn into him. Yeah. Mad props to uh, Pedro Pascal. Like he made that character. And yeah. just looking back, I can't see how people. I can see why people had doubts, but they were completely unfounded. I, I, I remember think that he race it. controversy. <laughs> so yeah. much happened in this season. It was just jammed, packed with events. Like I can't even remember Joffrey. He seems oh, like a distant yeah. memory. He seems like a That's distant a memory. Yeah. yeah. It's just, like, yeah, wow. It, even Craster's Keep, it just feels like it happened ages ago, even though it was only a couple episodes. But it felt like ah. such a huge amount of time passed in this season, um, and so much happened, and so many characters came and went. Scratch that. I'll go for the episode with uh, Craster's Keep, because I had completely forgotten about Craster's Keep. So that's the mm. blank spot. That's my least favorite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the more I think about Craster's Keep, the more. I, I guess I kind of slightly rationalized i mean it's obviously horrible but i slightly rationalized it at the time as being something that i'd expect from the books for example harren hall the bloody mummers it felt very much that kind of psychotic uh, collapse and corruption of war but seeing it is a lot more um horrific and like the way it was so sort of used as such an obvious plot device to to rationalize an already pretty clunky plot um, yeah, not it was really, such yeah. a distraction anyway from like John's actual storyline. Mm-hmm. I don't know how realistic this is, but if the wall storyline had been an elongated siege, I thought it would be infinitely better. Yeah, I think they just picked the battle. That's the the big moment that they wanted the they episode sh- nine to be, and so everything had to be um, manipulated around that, stretched and padded <laughs> out or sped up to fit that um, particular episode structure, which I think hurt it. I mean, I'm sympathetic to a point in the fact that things do need to be padded out because there might not necessarily be a lot of stuff in Mayreen or this or that, and they need to have everything moving at a, a consistent velocity. Although, obviously, Bran, they've completely scrapped and jumped straight to the end of Book 5 with him. But but um, at a certain point, it gets a bit boring, and they need to... Um, fig- yeah, I mean, it needs to be entertaining. They, at a certain point, you can't keep forgiving them. Well, I pondered this quite a bit after the uh, Episode 9 podcast we did, and I feel, and now I've changed my mind, and that they could have actually stretched it out. But what they should have done is had Mance pushing from north of the wall, like, really early, like, Episode 3-ish, 
just have him start attacking them and just have sort of low level background to John who's now sleep deprived and like trying to maintain order atop the wall and then still had nine like episode nine is the big battle but have it as that was the point when like assault team thin uh, stormed stormed castle black and that way it could have been a discreet battle but they could have maintained the siege and stared away from just really annoying filler I kind of in a way the more money they get the more big set pieces they get the less interesting the actual um, everyday writing is because it's all sort of uh, orbiting around these big action set pieces so i would have rather they not necessarily invested so heavily in the battle but the, the um like my my in my head i, I always wanted uh, season three to end with basically john arriving back at castle black collapsing and then waking up and seeing all of the wildlings he betrayed dead um, because they, they followed him to Castle Black and were defeated. And you wouldn't need to spend any money for that. And then the next season could have been the big confrontation with Mance. And as you say, it could have been spanned out over weeks and weeks and weeks as it was, because it is an attack. It's a siege. I mean, sieges take a long time. They're not single-day battles. They're protracted. They're drawn out. And, and the fact that it all seemed to center around Castle Black, again, just seemed to be simplifying it to dumb things down for viewers, um, when in reality it's a much more complex thing. Mance is, has a strategy in mind. He's thinning out the wall by attacking at various points. He has it in mind that he could dig up certain abandoned castles. He's, he's, ha- he's got a campaign against the, the Bridge of Skulls. He's attacking Eastwatch by the sea. It's much more complicated than the, the show did where where it was just Castle Black and, and just one John place. was just the defender of Castle Black because he's the hero of the, the story. But I didn't really like that. But it's good that they're all in one place again. They're not spread out. We've got all of this this ensemble cast in one location, so that'll be fun to flesh yeah, out. Yeah, time for some good character interactions. Yeah. Stan- all the Mance and Stannis. Too. Oh, my God. I can't wait to see that. I just, I really like the uh, John Stannis uh, bromance from the books. Yeah. Just that... That nod he gives to John when he beheads Slint is just I was I was giddy oh, so I was good. just like squirreling as I was reading the book just it's like, oh my god yes that's so amazing they're pros now <laughs> shut up and kiss <laughs> yeah I love the bit at the end of book three where um they're on top of the wall and Stannis is surveying the lands beyond the wall and they're talking about their older brothers who are dead now Robert and Rob and um and Stannis says something like no john says something like why did you take so long to come which that was really and Stannis kind of laughs he respects that but yeah it's good it's, it's a good relationship the cart before the horse and all that yeah. yeah yeah that's right yeah i'm forgetting all the lines but it was a great great scene which seems to have been forgotten because melisandre is just like yeah let's go to north because that's what i want to do yeah because <laughs> i'm the leader on team dragonstone not our messiah <laughs> figure screw that guy <laughs> It's different, as Wolfcast says. <laughs> that it is. That's copyrighted. We've got to pay them now. <laughs> well, we've already pinched Dragoncast show notes, so we just... We take taking... what is ours. <laughs> yeah, we're taking it by force, the Ironborn way. <laughs> cool. Um, any other questions? Um, any predictions for next season? I guess a lot of people are, are deciding... Season? Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of people are deciding whether they oh. want to continue because they are encroaching so heavily upon, especially with Bran. I mean, he's got what one chapter left. Yeah, I'm definitely watching. As I've said previously, I started with the show, so it can be I'll watch the the crummy but like guilty pleasure show version, and then eventually get the nice in depth thought provoking book version. So yeah, I'm sticking around. I think season five will be my last, unless The Winds of Winter comes out. What would it have to come out in 2015? 2015. Mm, it yeah. could happen. <laughs> Not unreasonable, guys. <laughs> the, the closer it gets, the more desperate we get. It could happen. Maybe he's just, uh, yeah, he's just polishing it up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Chapters in his room that he hasn't sent to his editor. Just dotting the T's, crossing the I's. That's all. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I think season five might be my last. Um, I feel like they've got enough material to cover because they, they have they have started to use up four and five material, but I think they have enough to cover um, another season with the Riverlands and all that and Dawn and maybe the Mine Islands, I guess we'll see. They but... just need to duck away from main characters. Like if they do what Feast did and like, yo, the Dornish are awesome. The Greyjoys are awesome. Brienne is, is awesome. Follow these people. I and don't he... think, yeah, I don't think they have. Feast caught a lot of flack for that. And I don't think HBO has the uh, balls that Martin has to just throw Tyrion, Jamie, oh, sorry, Tyrion, Danny, and John on a bus for a season. Mm, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of all the 
characters that are introduced in book four. I think they're just going to have to change a lot of things. Um, like that's that could be the beating pole we start up. Illyria get merged. Illyrio, Varys, and Tyrion. That could be cool. Yeah, little... I hope we see a good two or three episodes of that. Yeah, and then he, I guess he's on the road. I wonder if they're going to choose Aegon. I don't. Well, for, some reason, for some reason, I don't think they are. But I don't. I think I... Aegon is going to be de- the cause of death of at least one of Danny's dragons. And so I don't. If that theory holds true, then. I don't know, they're just going to have to come up with some really contrived dragon dying. Like, I feel... Grayscale. Dance... <laughs> yeah, oh that would be great. Yeah, mighty dragon brought down by, like, by magical plague. <laughs> or, or dragon dysentery. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, the pale man. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think after season five, if they start covering... Um, winds of winter chapters i might stop because i don't mind i don't mind getting like stuff ahead of time like uh, white walker baptism etiquette um but i think that knowing major event outcomes like cersei's trial or um the outcome of the battle of the battle of winterfell or the outcome of the battle of uh mayreen i think i'd prefer to read that as it was intended rather than just get it you know through chinese whispers through the show yeah, I, I'm gonna have to do some hibernation by season six. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. Like, but hey, I mean, you know, if on off chance that the book does come out 2016, 2015, then yeah, I'll be happy to watch. But other than that, maybe season five will be my last. So we'll see. I guess we'll get to that in two years or whatever. <laughs> Cross the bridge when we come to it. Yeah. But I'm happy. I mean, they've covered the three books that I really liked, the trilogy, and there was definitely a sense of finality to this scene. Arya's departure and Tyrion's departure and. Uh, Tywin's death, um, the consolidation yeah, a lot of characters. Of Unsullied the have been saying this is, it's like a whole new world now, like a whole new show. It is, yeah. yeah. The um the old world kind of crumbled this season. A lot of the big players, Joffrey and all that, they they were wiped out, and it's all these younger characters. I guess yeah, that's why they call the children. It's all the children of the the big guys. Mm. Mm. Another interpretation. Yeah, there was a lot of you can get a lot of mileage from the children. Or the, the dragons and the. Um, yeah, uh, Arya. Children of the Forest. Children of the Forest, uh, uh, Tyrion and his father. Uh, what else? They say this is like the mini game of the show. This is trying to stretch the title as far I, as you can. I like it. Because <laughs> they didn't know oh, yeah, it. It's great seasons, fun. But I like it. <laughs> Because, I mean, that's the problem. That's one of the big complaints with Game of Thrones. It does feel like this series of vignettes that aren't actually connected in any way. So yeah, if they try no central theme. Well, not, not even just a theme, just a like common world that everyone's interacting with each other. And it felt was a, a single world in, in season one, but so much uh, in season two and three. I mean, they were still very enjoyable, but it, it continued to fragment. Well, it's almost got that uh, like Call of Duty syndrome, essentially, just when a uh, Call of Duty, I think it was COD 4, had like a really coherent and praised plot, but uh, that was about the point where Call of Duty just took off and became like the main sh- mainstream shooter, and like subsequent games more and more became just chained events of just massive spectacle sh- uh, set pieces, and that's kind of what's happening to the show. It's like narrative threads that coherently link it together are less used in favour of the big flashy scene that makes you go wow that was amazing but yeah after that's which left scratching your head and that's the problem spectacle yeah. can't exist in a vacuum you need emotional investment in the players otherwise and i think i mean i think this season did the groundwork in terms of oberon and joffrey and those characters but if they continue to go by that logic big major events but they don't put in the groundwork to make you invest in these characters and there are going to be so many characters if they adapt faithfully to the books that it's, it's just going to be a mess and it's not going to be as uh, engaging and immersive as previous seasons but we shall see but um yeah i'm overall happy with the season um barring the lows it was very yeah, it, there was big lows and big highs awful, I think. awful i mean one or two scenes but if you just if you forget about then it's good <laughs> Well, that's the thing. People are saying it's far more inconsistent. There were huge highs, but then there were these moments that were just like really off-putting as opposed to maybe season two, which was far more level, even if it wasn't insanely good, it did feel consistent. Well, you could almost chalk that up to how much they were improvising stuff. Like uh, last week I said more and more a good scene tends to be based on was it Martin's or was it Benioff and Weiss's? And I'm sure if you, you broke it down, you would find a lot of the lows correspond to ad lib stuff. True, Don't get yeah. me wrong, like the yeah, uh, absolutely. the hound Brienne thing was amazing. I loved that. And that was them making stuff up. Like it's not all bad, but I think there's a definite correlation between on book and off book material and quality. Um anything else you wanna add or should we wrap up there? I think that's all. Oh yeah, today yeah. or yesterday, uh I think the rogue prince got released, which is uh, like an yeah. excerpt on the world of Ice Spike 
caught me by surprise. So no one's read it yet. Yeah, I saw that. I haven't read it. No, there are a lot been less... like pirated copies floating around for ages, but yeah, they're apparently well hidden. So no. it seemed to get a lot less fanfare than the Queen, the Princess and the Queen. Yeah, well, it was yeah. almost rushed. Like he announced it not long ago, didn't he? Like he's just like, hey, guess what? Surprise anthology coming out in a couple months. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but, um... Like, yeah, I've been I, hearing I heard... about the princess and the queen for years, like with yeah. the whole she wolves of Winterfell thing. Supposedly, this has all come from like a two hundred thousand word document of like the Targaryen histories, and he's just taking out slivers and publishing them in various. Yeah, anthologies. apparently it's just a few pages, so I want to either pirate it or read it in Target and then walk away. <laughs> <laughs> I I heard some of the audiobook; it sounds really dull. You know, Targaryen lineages, but hopefully, I don't know. Maybe there's some cool um, stories in there, even if the That's writing the itself is not engaging. Once Jorah Mormon starts going on about how much of a uh, swaggering badass the character is, that it'll probably pick up then. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Hopefully. I like some stuff in The Princess and the Queen, but it did feel like a giant Wikipedia article. Yeah. I love it, it makes like, me want to world read building and thing. stuff like that. Oh, that. That's what I'm in for. Cool. So, yeah, that brings us to the end of Krakencast for this week and also this season. Uh, however, there may be one or two bonus episodes. There might be an Osmoot in Melbourne, um, possibly occurring in a couple of weeks, and uh, a full castle recording, maybe. We'll see. Um, so thank you to everyone who listened and commented on the episodes. Uh, our downloads throughout the season have been really, really strong, so we appreciate that. And finally, thank you to all the hosts who've come on to share their opinions. Uh, compared to the Americans and the Europeans, you know, there aren't that many Australians or New Zealanders on the forums. So I'm really, really glad that we were able to um, get together and create like a little product of our own. But uh, thank you, um, Joseph. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And thank you, uh, Michael, for your first yeah, time. It was a pleasure. I'm very sad I missed out on the rest. I was always contemplating on the edge. I was like, no, nah, I'll just wait. I'll wait. And then well, no. I had to come on. No, I'm glad you came on on the last one, hopefully. I, I'm sure there'll be more Kraken cast in the future. We might do one for next, next season as well. Um, and what are Australian good. specific, I mean, oceanic specific, specific topics we can talk about that employ Kraken cast? <laughs> oh, just talking about how cool Krakens are and how they <laughs> kill everyone. and <laughs> How vastly superior our rugby teams are. Yeah. <laughs> I reckon the Greyjoys would have a pretty badass rugby team if they put their mind to it. <laughs> like, Victorian alone could carry them, but they've got, got a lot of talent in the Iron Islands. Or well, he'd be quarterback with his volcanic arm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Dragon Cast and Wolf Cast obviously will be out this week as well, so you can look forward to that. I think the Wolf Cast has become its own brand name at this point, so you'll you'll get lots more from them. I think. <laughs> um, also, thank you so much to Jessica for helping put this together. She was basically her idea to to create a um, Australian spin-off for the episode reviews and have a a, a time that was um, catered to this side of the world or this corner of the world. Thank you so much to Bing as well, and Tony from New Zealand, and Tanya. And uh, my name's Duncan, or Valkyrus on the forums, and this has been Kraken Cast for Season 4 of Game of Thrones, signing off. doesn't start raining i can't get any washing dry mm, yes. yeah story that. of my Sorry. life I it's freaking hot time. it's hot up there it's yeah it's hot in beijing incredibly hot hey, you <laughs> is it humid it's, hot it's, or no hot it's hot? dry it's just oh. dry and hot oh, that's our weather give it back <laughs> wait and wait and that when it, we enter you guys are in summer <laughs> It's yeah, that, winter at the summer. moment, so I want yeah. my summer back. Uh, so you have to go soon, Bing? Yeah, uh, probably at 6.30 or maybe a little later. So 40 minutes? Yeah. Okay, so um, if you guys want to do the chapter reading, do you want to do it afterwards? I don't mind. Okay, it's, it should only, I think it only take like 5-10 minutes. It's just, yeah, it's like a couple of pages, but yeah. No, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty short selection. It shouldn't take too long at all. But that's not the whole chapter, is it? I feel like no, no. Part- most of it's narration. I just, that's just the dialogue. Oh, it's, 
So we'll get to hear your lovely um, bedtime story voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your little thing voice. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, Ma- Michael, is this your first podcast? It is, it is. Hi, guys. Oh, welcome. Hello. Oh, hey. cool. Where do you come Hello. from? I'm from Australia. <laughs> I'm up on the Sunshine Coast. Actually, no, I better, I, better do this, I better do this during the actual episode. All right, so I'll, uh-huh. I'll do the introduction first, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, so quickly, I'm worried that the Australians finally outnumber us Kiwis again. Yes, yeah, so we need to bring in more. <laughs> the tide has turned. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to lose Tanya soon. <laughs> Tony, no. you're sick. It's all over for the New Zealand. <laughs> oh, no. Game oh, over. We can't be divided though. We need the to venom unite. Is spreading. We need to unite against dragon. No, no. Yeah, we need the New Zealanders. Could we sleep at least? I'm so tired, Ari, and my ass is sore. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. Do that one again. Yep. I'm so tired, Ari. And then my ass is 